Kamavalam for inviting me and um, giving me this wonderful opportunity to not only connect with my roots here in Pune, but also relive an incarnation I thought I had forgotten about. My incarnation as a trade and development advocate. I also want to congratulate you on this initiative. When I used to be JS uh, Economic Division and Multilateral Economic Relations in the MEA in the 90s, one of the main uh, uh, purposes that we set for ourselves was to take multilateral diplomacy, including and particularly in the economic area, to the regions, to our states. And uh, Pune, as an intellectual hub, deserves to really host such a conference. So thank you so much for that, and congratulations. And may you continue this uh, uh, in pioneering initiative and may it thrive. I also um, want to say that we have a distinguished panel on um, a very critical topic. You have had uh, discussions on the WTO, what's happening there, what are our interests, what are developing country interests, what are Asia's interests. But this is about the participation of developing countries in international trade in goods and services and the international trading system. Now I want to bring the two together to do a reality check because we have a system and how are the developing countries faring? We need to look at that. So let me first introduce the panelists very briefly. You all have their bios. So uh, first of all, my uh, dear colleague, Dr. Ambassador, Professor Mohan Kumar, the chairman of RIS, who has also authored a book on WTO negotiations. Then Ambassador Martin van der Berg, Ambassador of Netherlands and India, and former Director General for Foreign Relations, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Netherlands. So he has both the India perspective and the European Union and uh, Dutch perspective on the international trading system. And also, European Union has a very special um, kind of mentorship of the LDCs, so I'm sure he'll also be speaking on that. So we be, before we embark on the dialogue, I want to set the stage a little by tracing the big ideas in the political economic area uh, in the evolution of the whole concept of participation of developing countries in the international trading system and international trade. And uh, these, these concepts, these big ideas evolved, were, were conceptualized, brought into intergovernmental dialogue, and then taken on to other fora, including the w, GATT and WTO. So I think it's important to get a perspective on those concepts. Where have the developing countries come from there? And therefore, the relevance of many of the issues that we are now discussing in the WTO, like SND, or special and differential treatment. So the first of these, and the oldest of these, is the dependency theory, or the center periphery model uh, of trade and development, which was propounded by Raoul Prebisch and Hans Singer in the 1960s and 70s, and wherein, wherein it was argued that developing countries in the post-colonial period were structurally disadvantaged and at, were at the periphery of international production, 
trade, uh, and also uh, all, all the other aspects, finance, technology, and that the developed countries were at the core and were in turn exploiting both developing country markets and resources. So you need to rebalance that and change this whole context of unequal exchange. So that is the seed of this whole concept that developing countries need to be supported and helped in participating in international trade more equitably. Then the second big idea was uh, that trade has to serve development. That it's not an end in itself, it has to serve development, and it, has, it must accelerate economic growth. This was a very important aspect, acceleration of economic growth, reduce poverty, promote welfare, create jobs, and generate jobs in developing countries. So this, of course, therefore had to inform trade policy nationally, regionally, and globally. Also, all of these ideas were then, became the basis for SND treatment and integrating development into trade policies nationally and making the multilateral trading system more conducive to developing countries' equitable participation in international trade, changing the unfair terms of trade, creating a level playing field, and fair uh, rules of the game for international trade. Because GATT was, uh, I think Mohan will, uh, Dr. Mohan Kumar will explain this uh, in detail, so I'm not going to go into those details. But the idea was that this would provide developing countries and least developed countries special privileged market access to overcome their handicap and their handicap in productive capacity, competitiveness, etc., and give them flexibility to accept disciplines and commitments in the WTO uh, and undertake less than full reciprocity and progressive liberalization. So this SND concept is the other major uh, idea which persists till today and as you heard in the previous sessions is now coming under tremendous strain. Up until now, this was reflected in smaller or greater measure in the GATT WTO system and the GSP schemes, the generalized system of preference schemes of developing countries like the, and, and uh, also uh, now, as I said, it's coming, being questioned, particularly in terms of uh, asking for differentiation and going beyond differentiation, disqualification of some countries to get SND treatment. Now, in the 1990s to uh, 2000, uh, there was also a major discourse around the thesis of global interdependence among developed and developing countries uh, in, in, in trade, finance, technology relations. And this whole um, equation being a positive sum equation. And this is what I think even uh, the external affairs minister referred to this and it struck me uh, that these days the discourse is very much about a zero-sum game, that trade is a zero-sum game and I must win at any cost and the other must lose. But actually, there was a persistent case being made with evidence that if you grow, if you support developing countries, increase participation in trade and their export capacity, greater prosperity means you grow the consumer base, the global consumer base, uh, including for developed country exports of goods and services. So this mutual interdependence was a very powerful idea that was put forward for 
also uh, insisting that make the terms of trade, the, the rules of the game, conducive to developing countries so that the ecosystem uh, really comes out with positive some outcomes. Then there was this whole uh, talk, um, Dr. Kelkar will remember protectionism and structural adjustment uh, debate about developed countries vacating uh, the sunset industries and uh, you know, passing it on and, and the developing countries occupying those. And all of this has come, uh, come uh, to pass and today we do see that developing countries are the main producers of many of these um, uh, items uh, such as textiles and clothing, electronics, automobiles, and so on. Um, so what has happened? While some developing countries, mainly China, and I, I am going to also uh, you know, point to the China factor in, in all of this uh, discourse, have moved over to the core, claiming a greater share of world trade, diversified into manufacturers and even services, value-added exports, and many, especially, but many, especially the LDCs, are still stuck in the periphery. So we still need to have an international trading system that is sensitive to this, uh, to sensitive to developing country concerns and interests. But also, ironically, partly due to the success of China and other developing countries, the development rationale of trade and SNT treatment are coming under strain, and uh, both in terms of the existing disciplines as well as the uh, proposed new uh, disciplines. Now, in the last five years, again, there has been a huge debate. It started much earlier about the whole concept of globalization, which is the other powerful idea that related to trade, investment, technology. And um, in this period, there has been, uh, again ironically, now uh, a, a discontent with globalization has gone beyond some developing countries to developed countries and um, not in uh, a small measure uh, related to um, uh, China and its success, trade success, and its systemic competitiveness, if I may call it that, and success as a global manufacturing hub, and becoming number one in international trade in 2013. So all of that has made the very votaries of globalization and uh, those who thought they were the main beneficiaries of globalization to question the value of globalization and you know, adopt protectionist stances. So this globalization, the whole issue of beneficial globalization is something that is also behind uh, the uh, new uh, trade protectionism that we see but also, uh, no wonder then that Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winning economist, um, had us revisit globalization and its discontents in the era of Trump. So, I, the second major aspect I would briefly like to touch upon is the scale and scope of developing country participation in international trade. It has increased significantly. Just consider these facts. Their share of global exports of merchandise went up to nearly 49%. And merchandise trade overall is 47% in 2018. It's significantly up from 1995 and 2000. Their services export trade went up to 30% in 2018, and their share in total services trade went up to 34%. 
The developing countries account for 40% of global GDP now. It's a big jump. Then the developing countries account for, and this is really a sea change, 54.4% of global FDI inflows and 41.5% of global outflows. This is again a, a major change. The value of some developing countries as big emerging markets and regional and global trade engines has increased uh, considerably and nearly 50% of trade now involves some developing country or the other. So, and of course, as we all know, South-South trade has also taken a big leap. But in all of this, we must remember the force multiplier is China. Further, no other continent is a poster girl, I say, not poster boy, poster girl for trade, acting as an engine for development than Asia. And the most dazzling example of that is, of course, China becoming both a regional and global locomotive. Uh, with, well, I don't have to dwell on China's uh, leap, uh, great leap, if I may use that term in a different context. But um, China's hyper-competitiveness, uh, as someone has called it, has had a trade displacing impact on many other developing countries, though it has also aggressively invested in Asian, African, and Latin American and Central and West Asian countries, including LDCs, to mine and import commodities and to locate to sell manufacturers and services and become their number one trade and investment partner in many, many cases. So the India story, I don't want to dwell because I think you have had long discussions on it. Exports and imports have been growing uh, steadily, and uh, ASEAN is another growth pole for trade. But if you're looking at the LDC economy, Bangladesh, somebody referred to the global value chain, positive experience of Bangladesh, uh, and it has, it's a good story to tell, but overall, LDCs did not fare well uh, and are nowhere near uh, reaching the target set in the 2010 LDC conference for uh, doubling their mere 1% of world trade. Uh, this is what the situation is in terms of uh, the reality on the ground. And whether China and developing countries in Asia and elsewhere can keep up for better policy making, bringing together all stakeholders and then defining a position and then engaging uh, to the issue based in these negotiations. Um, I will now ask, uh, I invite Dr. Mohan Kumar to tell us uh, what the state of play is, what are the challenges that developing countries face, and what are the solutions that we can Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank the Pune International Center, Dr. Marshall, Dr. Kater, and my colleague and friend, Ambassador Gautam Bambavale. Thank you, Ambassador Lakshmi Puri, for that masterly broad canvas. Uh, I thought it was, a, it was an excellent overview against which myself and my colleague from Netherlands can try to pinpoint some challenges faced by developing countries. Uh, some opening remarks, if I may, which is clarificatory in nature. If you look at uh, trade literature normally, you'll find a footnote which says 
Developing countries, the term developing countries includes least developed countries as well. For the purposes of this article, for the purposes of this essay, etc. I think we are past that stage. I tend to think of least developed countries now as a bloc who have their own interests to defend. They may support developing countries from time to time, but that is not always the case. So that is something that needs to be borne in mind. I will use the term developing countries, but I thought this clarification is important. The second one is that if you see the solidarity of developing countries, you will find it interesting that in fora, which is characterized by soft law, it tends to be very strong. Non online movement, G77. So if you go to a ministerial conference in Antar and the United Nations, solidarity will be very high. Rhetoric is high, and most developing countries, for example, will even make contradictory statements in Antar vis a vis of YouTube. So that is a factor, frankly, of hard law versus soft law. Because in the WTO, you don't have necessarily long debates and so on. It's hard law. It's dollars and cents. It's your interest. So naturally, there are significant interests even among developing countries. So in, uh, when it comes to the international landscape, and I'm grateful to Ambassador Lakshmi Puri for laying out this broad canvas, but since uh, she has said I must address the specific changes, the challenges, and a solution that probably is uh, beyond my pay grade, whatever that might be, post-retirement. But I will at least try and tell you the main trends which can be very significant in terms of changes to the international trading and economic landscape. The first one that suggests itself automatically is that clearly, and previous speakers have spoken to it, we're moving away from multilateral negotiations to plurilateral negotiations. Now, I want to also give you a personal history of my involvement in the legal drafting group of the WTO. One of the things that we were extremely careful in the legal drafting group of the Uruguay Round was we wanted to carry forward the practice of all decision making in WTO on the basis of consensus. Very rarely, and in fact none, but maybe few instances, there is no voting in the WTO. Any small country, big country, can actually block the entire negotiating process, much to the chagrin of people who want things to go forward. Guess which were the two countries which very much wanted this consensus room and which were against majority trade-weighted voting. The two countries were, one of them, one was the most powerful democracy in the world, the other was the largest democracy in the world. Both US and India said, no voting. So I was very young, I was perhaps not so initiated, informed, so I asked my senior colleagues, why the hell are we doing this? And then there was this wonderful explanation given by one of my bosses, who said the nightmarish scenario in the WTO is that the Americans blocking a textile agreement, saying I'm not interested in elimination of quotas in textiles, and India blocking the intellectual property rights agreement. So people said no, things have to be done on the basis of consensus, and neither US nor India was actually interested in voting, because both countries knew that in the scheme of things in the WTO, they would be massively outvoted. United States would be outvoted because the majority of the members were actually developing countries. And in India's case, in retrospect, it seems really ironical to say this, Bangladesh, Vietnam, uh, Sri Lanka, they were not demanding elimination of quotas and textiles. It was India which was demanding elimination of text quotas and textiles. And look what has happened now. Anyway, that's for another day and another session. But what I want to say is we're moving now clearly away from the principle of consensus. Now, if you are going to do plurilateral negotiations in the WTO, my proposition to you as, as, is as follows. Technically, very technically, you actually cannot start a plurilateral negotiation in WTO unless there is consensus. That would be my first argument. You've already started and that's the deeper this year. That's another matter. Politics has taken over. But very technically and legally, 
You cannot start a plurilateral negotiation in WTO unless you have consensus among all the members of the WTO. That's the first. The second point is, if there is a plurilateral negotiation in the WTO, some important criteria must be followed. One, it must be open to all members of the WTO. Second, the outcome must be made applicable to all on an MFM basis, whether you are members of the plurilateral or not. And lastly, there should be no penalty for countries for not joining. And they must be free to join at a later date. Now, when I heard um, the interesting session in the morning, there seem to be people who think that some of these rules may or may not be followed in the plurilateral negotiations currently underway in the WTO. That would be the first and foremost challenge for developing countries. You can stay out of the plurilateral negotiations, but if the criteria that I just outlined are not followed, then a country like India would actually find itself in a very, very bad place. So that is challenge number one. The second trend that we see is that MFM-based trade is being gradually replaced by FTA-based trade. I dare say the original sinners were United States and EU, US did NAFTA and the EU had customs union and the WTO started blessing every FTA without serious examination as to the consequences on the impact of multilateral trade. They just said okay to every FTA, whether the FTA supported multilateral trade, whether the FTA was trade diversionary, trade creating, no serious examination took place. In fact, if my memory serves me right, not a single FTA has been rejected by the WTO so far. So because of this and a whole lot of other things, multilateral, I'm sorry, uh, the MFM-based trade is going to be replaced by FTA-based trade. Now, that poses a challenge for countries like India, which in any case were not big fans of FTA. But quite apart from that, the problem I see for developing countries, when I look at the US-Mexico-Canada Free Trade Agreement, I look at the Comprehensive Progressive Free Trade Agreement of the Pacific, I look at RCEP, they are going to establish norms and standards, whether you like it or not. We talked of global value chains before the lunch. If India has to get on to global value chains, your products and services, whether you are part of an FTA or not, will have to conform to those norms and standards being established by actors other than yourselves. You are not part of those FTAs. But they will decide what is the technical barrier to trade for an industrial product, what is the sanitary and phytosanitary standard for Indian mangoes, Indian buffalo meat, Indian vegetables, and so on. And this will impact hugely on India's trade and exports. So that is the second trend and the second challenge. How do developing countries conform to standards and norms established by FTAs? The third, in the Uruguay round, it will interest some of you to know that we oppose the Intellectual Property Rights Agreement, as we did the Services Agreement. When India suggested cherry picking in the Uruguay round, the developed countries told us, no, you will have to lump it and either accept all or nothing, which was defined as single undertaking. Today, we are back to cherry picking. Anybody can pick out one agreement and say, I am part of this plurilateral, not part of the other plurilateral. You can be part of some, all, whatever. So we are again moving from single undertaking to cherry picking. All these, if you note, are leading to a serious fragmentation of the multilateral trading system. And I am about to make the point that such fragmentation is very difficult to confront by developing countries in general and by countries like India in particular. The other big trend that I see, multilateral dispute settlement mechanism will be replaced more or less by unilateral sanctions. I mean, we had lengthy discussions on how the appellate body has uh, certainly, you know, uh, being made goodbye. So we have a panel procedure. This is the bad old gap days. But the bad old, the bad old gap days also means that powerful countries will be able to accept or reject panel reports as per their convenience. 
bigger countries will be made to accept the panel reports, failing which there could be unilateral sanctions for which there could be some moral sanction in the form of a GATT panel report. So that is the other big change. It will interest some of you to know that when we negotiated this new organization, there was consensus that the organization will be called multilateral trade organization. All the papers were printed, many forests were cut down, and millions and millions of dreams and dreams of papers were kept ready saying, we will inaugurate the MTO. Last minute, there was an American senator, Patrick Moynihan, who called the deputy director general of the, no, sorry, the negotiator, American negotiator at the time, um, Andrew Stoller, and told him, we don't like this word multilateral. So when he told me that, I said, hey, why not? I thought this was the perfect name. He said, no, it's vague. We don't know what that means. I said, everybody else seems to know what multilateral is. What is your problem? The real problem was the Americans were never convinced that they needed an organization that could somehow nullify their special 301 and unilateral sanctions. The Americans wanted to keep open the possibility of unilateral sanctions. And that is why the, the, all of the papers were destroyed, all the booklets were destroyed, and then we chose this word, World Trade Organization. India tried to make a fuss of it, but then we were making a fuss about so many other things, we said, okay, what's in the name? So we didn't pursue that further. But the fact is, the Americans were viscerally opposed to the word multilateral. And now I suspect that they might have been fulfilled, because now there is really nothing in terms of international shackles to stop the US from really carrying out unilateral sanctions. So that is the other challenge. The last challenge that I see, which Ambassador Lakshmi put a hint upon, is the shift from globalization to deglobalization. That is a challenge in its own, and we need a separate session for that. But my point here is very limited. At a time when developing countries are yet to fully avail of globalization, China has done it, some others may have done it, but certainly India is on the cusp of doing it and other countries are about to do it, you are going to see the terms and conditions of trade completely change. If 3D printing comes about, I don't know what textiles and clothing factories in India will do, or Bangladesh for that matter. So if, if there is a fourth industrial revolution, it will completely change trade in a way that many of us are not prepared for. Then the question is, what do you do with your existing factories? Fortunately, we have a big market. And therefore, I agree with panel members who before lunch said, maybe this is a time to play safe and protect our market, because we just don't know how these things will play out. I really also believe, and this I think the audience must appreciate, the WTO has missed a trick or two, frankly. I mean, it can justify itself at the end of the day, uh, power is the might is right. But the fact is, India has got this image of being a naysayer in the WTO. We keep saying no to everything. I want to be clear to this audience that that's simply not true. We have been crying ourselves hoarse about movement of natural persons, mode four of the services agreement. We have said we are not interested in exporting nurses, we are not interested in exporting carpenters, we are not interested in exporting laborers. But at least for our project executors, engineers, and qualified people, there must be a way in which the GATS agreement, the General Agreement on Trade and Services, and the WTO can help us do it. There is absolutely no traction for that. And I will tell you personally, we had a negotiating group on movement of natural persons, which used to finish in half an hour, out of which 20 minutes I spoke. There was nobody else who spoke. The developed countries did not even show the courtesy of responding to me and saying, we find your proposals nonsensical. I would have been happy if they had said, okay, what you're saying is nonsense, we reject it. Even that was not forthcoming. The other area where India desperately wanted was geographical indications, intellectual property rights. If champagne and some spirits can get additional protection, why not Basmati rice? And why not some of our things which we hold very dearly? Again, these things did not find any traction in the WTO. And to add insult to injury, essentially the Doha round is now well and truly buried. I mean, the whole 
idea of Doha Ram was it was under pressure that India accepted the launch of the Doha Ram. The 9-11 attacks had a significant role to play, I must admit. But it is also that we were promised by the WTO that development needs of the developing countries and least developed countries will be at the heart of these negotiations. Now that has not come to pass. So you have a challenge in which developing countries, which certainly, and I can be frank with all of you, that we did not really have too much love for WTO, but nevertheless, as somebody said in the morning, traffic lights, example, whatever, he provided a certain framework for negotiations. He provided a certain predictability and security to multilateralism. Now we've gone completely to the other extreme. Look at special and differential treatment. I mean, my first panel, I'm sorry, Ambassador Puri, I'm giving some personal anecdotes, but they are relevant to the point I'm making. Thank you for the indulgence. My first panel, that GAT panel, as a panelist was 1994, just before the entry of uh, force into the WTO, EC anti-dumping duties against Brazil. I was the only developing country panelist. The other two were panelists from developed countries. That often happens when you have developed country and developing country locked, locked in a battle in a GAT panel. They normally put one fellow from the developing country hoping he will defend. So I went on hammering at the special and differential treatment provision of the anti-dumping agreement. I said, with this agreement, I don't see how you can justify EC anti-dumping duties on cotton yarn in Brazil. I was told clearly by an American lawyer, please look at the language. I said, yes, I'm looking at the language. The language said, it should be recognized that developing countries get preferential treatment. And he said, Mohan, you know as much English as anybody else, the word should means nothing. So I said, are you saying special and differential treatment, the whole para means nothing? He said, yes, I'm sorry, you guys have been had. You know, you can negotiate whatever you want. The fact of the matter is, unless there is a clear obligation in terms of clear language in the WTO, this is what we will do. So that left an indelible impression on me. And I said, at least in the implementation agenda that we were trying to forward after the Uruguay round, developing countries made the point that special and differential treatment provisions must be operationalized and made strong. And imagine our surprise today. Here I am standing and looking at a scenario where, forget about strengthening the special and differential treatment provisions, the developed countries are seeking to do away with special differential treatment altogether. So I'm sorry, but you know, having spent a decade in Geneva negotiating at the GATT and then the WTO, the WTO has not been faithful and true to itself and to the developing countries. So the real challenge now is, what do developing countries do? I have certain prescriptions, not full, and uh, I'm not sure they're also complete, but first, we have to resist at least the serious erosion of SND in the WTO. What is SND, Special and Differential Treatment? I want the audience to know. Essentially, it means you get more time for implementing obligations compared to a developed country. It is nobody's case that my colleague's country, Netherlands, and my country, India, should have exactly five years to implement obligations arising out of a new trade. It cannot be anybody's case. Netherlands is a fabulously rich country. I would argue we are a desperately poor country. So obviously, if they take five years to implement laws and regulations to meet a new agreement in the WTO, we should get 10 years, at least 10 years. That's all SND says. Number two, it says technical assistance. In some agreements of WTO, there is some requirement that developing countries must be treated better. It is not as if somehow this idea by Americans that dollars are being doled out to developing countries like China and India in the name of SND is completely wrong. The obligations undertaken by TRIPS agreement today, whether it is India, United States or Europe, is exactly the same. Americans may want higher levels of intellectual property rights. They need to negotiate that in the WTO. But whatever the Uruguay round has prescribed in terms of standards for intellectual property rights, we are fulfilling that. 
If he has two fully back, and even if he doesn't, they are most welcome to take us to dispute settlement, which they have killed, by the way. So that's an irony in and of itself. But what I'm saying is, SLD, therefore, is not some great concession of cost. It is essentially to tell developing countries that developed countries took 100 years to reach a particular level of development. We don't mind if you have to take more time. And mind you, this is essentially not for what is known as tariff concessions. The European Union was intrusive. Intellectual property rights meant that India had to completely overhaul its domestic law, from product patents to process patents. So, pro process patents to product patents, the other way around. So, basically, these things take time. You have to put a bill through Parliament, you have to get these things done. So, obviously, the time element is not something that anybody can dispute. So, it's a real pity in this sense that the WTO has taken a particular turn. What can developing countries do to this? I think they must do whatever they can to save this organization, if they can. I was very scared when Harsh uh, said in the morning that the WTO, he of course was careful, he said, I'm not saying it will, but it might become a place which houses PTAs and FTAs. That would be a disaster. And that is not the original intention of the drafting uh, of the drafting people of WTO. So really, that is not the purpose of WTO at all. We harped on universal membership, we harped on consensus, we harped on actually everybody's rights and obligations being similar. So if all that is going to go for a six, then it's, it's a tough, it's a really a tough situation for developing countries. The other thing developing countries can do in terms of responding to the crisis is use the leverage of the market. I'm particularly delighted about what the Africans have done. That's the right thing to do. Uh, the, the, the comprehensive free trade agreement that they have embarked upon is a brilliant response to everybody else except the Africans. You know, there is a political scientist from Sweden, Hans Rosling, who talks in terms of the universal pin code of the world. Today's world is represented by 1114. That is the universal pin code. 1114 is essentially the population of the world is 7 billion humans, 1 billion in Americas, 1 billion in Africa, 1 billion in Europe, and 4 billion in Asia. That is today. In 2040, he says it will be 1125. Americas will continue to be 1 billion. Europe will be 1 billion with a lot of luck. We may be less than that, uh, but we will give you the benefit of the doubt. Africa will double its population from 1 to 2. Africa's current population is 1, it will become 2 billion. And Asia will go from 4 to 5, essentially because of India, not because of China, because China has already peaked. And this makes it vital that Africa is really the market of the future. And that is why one of the ways in which developing countries can meet this existential challenge in trade and commerce, is to have a free trade agreement. And I really think, I commend the Africans, I don't know how it will play out, but they tell me it's going well. And the Comprehensive Free Trade Act Agreement in Africa is one way to go. And we may have to think of those things in our region as well. Because with this development, Asia, and in particular South Asia, remains the least integrated region in the world. We used to say South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. But now I'm not sure if they say Sub-Saharan Africa anymore, because they have really managed to do this. We will have to, I think, and I'm going to now maybe conclude and take more questions on the floor if possible. What to do now in terms of uh, uh, what, the, what, what the WTO can do, what multilateral negotiations can do. I like the point that Ambassador Lakshmi Puri made. Trade is a means to an end. Absolutely. You know, I wish somebody would go back to the Havana chapter, which was about it. It talked of employment. You know, after all, why are the Western countries against free trade today? Because there are more losers than winners. As simple as that. And that is how Donald Trump and others got elected as well. You know, this theory that free trade um, lifts everyone and the rising tide lifts all boats is no longer true, frankly. There are at least equal winners, equal losers. Now, there's also another troubling phenomenon, which is that inequalities between countries have become 
mind, inequalities within countries are rising, including our own. And I think I attribute this really to the impact of free trade. So if trade cannot serve the purpose of the following three objectives, full employment, reducing inequality, and allowing each country to chart out its space of development. You cannot have a one rule, one size fits all. That's obvious. So if you cannot accommodate these three requirements of employment, of, uh, of a country wanting to proceed at a particular level, if you can't fulfill these three criteria, then I'm afraid trade is going to be looked down on. The consensus for free trade, even in India, is under pressure. You know, after all, India should be embracing free trade with unbridled enthusiasm because we managed to pull out 100, 200 million people out of poverty. But even in India, there are voices against free trade. We know that. And the reason is this. Inequalities within the country become so big that the poor people seem to think that, listen, getting, I don't know, American craft cheese and New Zealand powder, milk powder, may not be such a great idea after all. If it, if it means they're going to be perceived badly in the first instance, but also, you know, job losses and so on. So employment is extremely important. Inequality is extremely important. And I think a country's policy space to allow a country to develop at the pace at which it chooses to becomes very vital if WTO wants to. Otherwise, frankly, the nightmare for me is that the WTO is reduced to OECD peace. You become a rich country club, that's all. Maybe China is already rich, maybe it'll become richer. But otherwise, I see a real danger where the WTO may become just a rich country club in which a few people can get together and do what they want, but you have to be at a particular level of development and a particular attitude towards trade issues. I, since one of the great joys of being retired and being an academic and a think tanker is to say what one wants, so I'm going to say what I want, which is I really believe the right thing to do would be to launch an SDG round of trade negotiations. Yeah. Frankly, because it doesn't make sense to me. Why would I want to trade if my main SDG objectives, abolition of poverty, gender equality, uh, access to health, digital access to everyone. If these things are not met, why would I want to trade with anybody? There are some things higher in life than trade, and they have to be accepted. And if SDGs were negotiated with so much of painstaking effort by our negotiators, the problem in the WTO is they tend to think, and we had this problem even when we negotiated trade and environment, they think nothing can trump Trade, no pun intended. I'm not talking about Donald Trump. So nothing can trump a WTO agreement. We, we met and said something like an AIDS crisis, something like the coronavirus. Obviously, the TRIPS agreement, you just have to throw it in the bin. How can you think of TRIPS agreement? If China wants to import a patented drug tomorrow, and they want, and that's the only drug which will cure the problem, are you seriously telling me they have to negotiate with a patent holder? The TRIPS has a public health exemption. So you just use it. So I think we have to understand that WTO agreements serve a useful purpose, but there are some higher things in life. And I think for a country like India, I would say SDG goals are so much more important, and that will get you the willing participation of all countries. So thank you very much once again for your attention. Thank you, Mohan, for that brilliant presentation. And uh, of course, as you can imagine, it uh, warmed the cockles of my heart, the UN heart that I have, that you have uh, proposed uh, the SDG round of trade negotiations. Thank you for that. Uh, and now, Ambassador Lochan, to give us, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the European Union perspective, the Dutch perspective, and also some insights into how you see the LDC uh, perspective uh, with regard to the international trading system and their participation in it. Thank you. Thank you so much, and it's really an honor and it's also a pleasure to be here.
to thank you in uh, for organizing this dialogue and hopefully it will be a, a structural dialogue. I'm now here for about uh, almost one and a half year uh, yeah, at Dutch Ambassador in India. And when I came about 13 months ago, I started, well, at least tried to start to learn Hindi, which is uh, not an easy task to do for me. But my Hindi teacher uh, told me he was not only teaching students in Delhi, but also teaching students in Germany, the Netherlands, to all kinds of WhatsApp technologies and whatsoever. And I think that's a perfect example of how services are becoming more and more tradable, which is, I think, a very important trend today. And at the same time, we see the jumpless growth of manufacturing. And I think Richard Bolton wrote a very nice book about it. He calls it Globotics. You could call it Globotization. It's a huge transformation happening in the economy with huge impacts on trade, on labor, labor markets, and that will affect all of us, whether we are developing countries or developed countries. Today we also spoke a lot about what's happening in, in the process or the erosion of globalization, deglobalization. And we see protectionism everywhere, we see the crisis in the WTO, the, at the body discussion we heard about this morning, the Brexit we see in the EU, unilateral trade policies, and these are actually all policy choices, and those policy choices also uh, impact us all. So whether we are developing countries or developed countries. We also see many concerns all over the globe. Subsidies distorting economic activities in global markets, the role of state-owned enterprises, and fair competition, increasing inequality, poverty, sustainability issues, all of us were a huge concern. And finally, as was discussed this morning also, we see a rule-based system which benefit all of us in the past, is not delivering anymore what we asked for. So there is, in a way, a big crisis. And we know that in to achieve certain outcomes in markets, markets need to be governed. Markets, markets and governors, markets and governments are not substitutes, but markets need strong governance. That's what also global markets need. But we don't see that happening today. And why not? I think, on the one hand, was said earlier, if you look to at least Western countries, the rise of uh, nationalism has translated into protectionism. And we see today that trade negotiations are not anymore about concerns, about interests, but more and more exercises in power politics. And I think, again, we will all lose with that, and especially the developing countries. We all pay, pay a price for this. We all pay, pay a price for protectionism. I saw statistics about the US-China trade war. It was the cost $65 billion in 2019. And that thing will be much higher in 2020. So what should we do about it? Let me give me some personal observations on this. I think it's not helpful to frame the trade debate in a debate between developing and developed countries. Of course, there are differences in concerns, differences in interests, but at the same time, there are many issues which affect us all, whether it's about e-commerce, about unfair competition, about uh, rising uh, monopolists, monopolistic behavior in uh, on platforms, so we should also take into account the more gray and more nuances in the global picture. And of course, we need to discuss flexibility and obligations. Of course, there are different parts of obligations. And I think it's a key discussion because it hurts us all that we're not able to move forward on this debate. History shows that developed countries can benefit enormously about participation in the global trade, in uh, GVCs. But participation in global trade, in global value change, is not only about trade policies. I think you rightly said it also, it's also very much about domestic policies, about national policies. And we see great examples also in domestic policies of how to improve your infrastructure, education, uh, whatsoever on and which brings a better participation in the global economy. And I think it would be 
very important to have business platforms to include also the business society to identify these concrete examples, concrete barriers to participate and address them in national policies. So in a way also to connect trade policies with domestic policies. Another issue about this is import restrictions. I think you need to import to be able to export, to be able to participate in GDPCs. Tariffs, local content requirements, understandable sometimes for specific reasons of protecting, protecting internet industries or protecting against unfair competition. On the other, on the other hand, you can shoot yourself in the foot because it can be make it more difficult to participate in the global economy. As I said earlier, we see economic transformations taking place with drastic consequences for labor and trade. And we see issues like data flows, competition, taxation, we're all facing these, these discussions. And these are discussions very much important to have also in Geneva. So we should widen the discussion, widen the issues we take on the agenda instead of blocking these discussions. Of course, again, the interests, the concerns are different, but we should have those discussions, including every partner in the world. And of course, we are more and more sometimes going to a world of plurilaterals, to a world of coalitions of the winning. But we should keep plurilaterals open. We should keep continuing discussions how to keep them open and to keep a kind of a multilateral dimension in the plurilaterals. Let me say a few words about the LDCs and also the role of the Netherlands and the EU in LDCs. Today, the LDCs take about 2% of 1% uh, of global trade, but for them, participating in global trade is extremely important. And for the EU, it is very important. So we do have zero tariffs to enter the EU market for them. We're helping them to get export goods and services to the EU on the basis of training, complying to standards. We support them for capacity building in trade policies. And we support them in free trade by supporting, for example, small farmers uh, and in uh, producing more in a sustainable way. We also support LDCs from the EU perspective with the trade facilitation agreements. And we support them in trade negotiations. We do have special regimes, as you know, G GSP, GSP Plus, Everything Good Art initiatives. And we are working very intensively on the economic partnership agreements to, more, to make them more WTO compatible. So the role and the place and the position of LDCs is very important and very close to us in the Netherlands as well as the EU. So just to go back and finalize to the global trade architecture. I think it's very, very important to find a way to go back to the multilateral system, but with an open mind, especially important for developing countries. Otherwise, we, will, otherwise risk, we will risk that trade policies will be a game of power and not a rule-based system. And especially, as I said earlier, I think it's important to, in a world of free trade agreements, of regional trade agreements, it's important to find a common ground among those FTAs, maybe dimensions, dimensions for mutualization. I find it also would stress the role, the, the role of the G20. In 2022, India will chair the G20. As uh, Dajakar said on the first day, the G20 was formed in hard times. We definitely have now hard times in trade. So maybe India and the EU is very much work, look like to work with them to trade, play a leadership role in putting those discussions on the G20 agenda. But that, of course, requires the long-term preparation. So we actually we should maybe start today about it. And finally, I think the WTO needs sometimes some successes. We have the WTO ministerial coming up in the Kazakhstan, and hopefully we can have even some minor successes there. For example, on the fishery subsidies.
So to conclude, the first day we had a discussion about the invisible hand of the market and the other hand of trust. I think we definitely need the hand of trust in the real retail processes. Thank you so much. No, uh, not everyone in Asia is averse to FTAs. So, China has uh, signed FTAs with a number of countries. Vietnam has just signed an FTA with EU. And ASEAN has a long history of signing FTAs. So, I have to regretfully note that India is the outlier. And I think um, one is a political explanation as to why they're not and second, of course, is a practical problem. The political explanation for why India is averse to FTAs and believes in multilateral uh, negotiations much more is partly, I think, because of our rough neighborhood. Where I think South Asia, to be honest, uh, remains the only region which has allowed politics to trump economics. Every other region has managed to allow economics to trump politics. I was talking to somebody in the ASEAN. It's not as if the Malaysians and the Singaporeans love each other. Uh, but they managed to set aside politics. China and Taiwan. I mean, are you seriously telling me India-Pakistan relations or, you know, is this worse than China-Taiwan? China practically says you are mine. Come on. At least we are not saying Pakistan is ours, right? I hope you're not. So, I'm saying. So basically, it is ridiculous. But we are the only region. So that is the political explanation. Why it is happening, I don't know. But this is, this is something that needs to be explored. The second practical reason for India, I genuinely believe we are a truly generous country and the rest of the world is finding it difficult to accept us because we are, we are really a developing and a least developed country rolled into one. Right. We do not share uniform characteristics, and what I'm saying is obvious. You go to the south of the country, you go to the east, you go to the west, you will know the differences, right? And the developed part of the country is so minuscule, like you have to look for it with a microscope, you will find it in some gated communities. By and large, we are a developing country, but I dare say there are parts of the country which are least developed. So this is not readily understandable to others. Now, in a multilateral negotiation, you can only make a rule for everybody. You can't make a rule just for India. That's, that's the other problem. Uh, we think that everybody should make a rule for us, but that's okay. That is self-righteousness of the India. That's fine. But the rest of the world, when 170 countries start get together and make a rule, they're not going to be able to take into account the Indian exceptionalism beyond the point. So I think I, I can't really think of anything else to say in response to your question, but do not say the rest of Asia, because Asia is doing a lot of FTAs with each other, with others, and so on. We are, I think, the outlier. We managed to do FTAs, but for me, the three biggest economies in the world are US, EU, China. 
India has to have an FTA with at least two of them. So we have to have FTAs with at least two of them. Your, you know, guess as to which those two should be. Make up your mind. Uh, but I don't believe that we can just get by uh, relying on MFN trade. That's the point I make. I may also add that uh, with what you are suggesting is a pan-Asian FTA. That will really be a mega, mega FTA. And um, in, in some senses, our step is uh, moving towards that, whether it is the ginger group moving towards a pan-Asian uh, FTA is something that time will only tell. I now have another question, uh, Mohan, to you again, and it is uh, based on what you said about the global population about uh, 1125. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, how trade uh, will uh, solve the problem specific to uh, this issue, and whether making India is more beneficial. This is our question. And then the second one is how digital dictatorship will impact this. Is this being factored into the world? And I think you will be wanting an opening to talk about the challenges of e commerce and data and Internet of Things, all of that coming up in the negotiations. So you may like to throw some light on that. First question was about the population, that whether there is anything uh, specific that trade can do to address this whole issue of, uh, and also whether make in India is more beneficial. So, so very briefly, we are a 2.7 trillion economy and 45 to 50 percent of it is international trade or foreign trade. Uh, the worrying thing is that the share of foreign trade in our GDP has been declining. There is a secular trend over the last 10 years, and it's been declining. I think this needs to be reversed. So if you want to become a 5 trillion economy, I put it to you that we need to double our exports and double our imports. We have to get, up the par get out of the paradigm thinking that all imports is bad and all exports is good. Obviously, if you are importing plastic Diwali lamps from China and uh, you know discriminating against the lovely um, mud, earth, earth, earth uh, you know, Diwali lamps made in India, that's a bad import. But import of Chinese steel, import of Chinese intermediate goods is not a bad thing because your exporters actually benefit, they get cost advantage, and so on. I do believe that without trade. We will have a problem with this Hans Rothschild scenario. Uh, I am a believer in demographic dividend, but I also believe if we don't watch out, it can very quickly become a disaster. And that that goes to the heart of education skills and so on. But here the question is about trade, and I do not see a way out. I think in the panel session that Dr. Vivek gave for our chair. There were, there were a lot of discussion on how exports are so important. In the summing up, he said, he said that. The net export share, I was fascinated to hear him say it's 20%. So without exports, import, we are not North Korea now. That might have been the case 30, 40 years ago. We are sufficiently integrated with the global economy. Without trade, we are dead, right? And that is the real existential challenge for India. On uh, the Make in India question, I would say, as long as you make it India for, not just India, but the world, it's fine. So, if Foxconn is putting up a project in Noida, and you can proudly say, conceived in San Francisco, assembled in Noida, I'm okay with that. The iPhone. That is, I'm okay with that. Similarly, if there is something else to be assembled here, but which will mean, again, massive imports, you all know that in an iPhone, the Chinese value addition is barely 10%. I think they have to get used to it. Uh, that, that is the kind of imports that will come first. And, and I think as long as it is made in India for the world, we should be okay with it. The last question I'm deeply grateful because uh, that was a serious omission for my, for my talk. And sometimes when you speak of the script that happens, and this is uh, data. 
uh, the whole question of data, data is the new oil and so on. Digital dictatorship may be an extreme term, um, as is India becoming a digital colony, but please understand that we have now three spaces in the world. You have a space which is dominated by what the French call GAFA, which is Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. You can add Alphabet and everything else to it. So GAFA, that is essentially the American European space. You then have got China, which is blocked outside of participation, but they've got their own giants, Alibaba, Tencent, whatever. Then you've got huge masses of virgin data territory in two spaces of the world. One is Africa, the other is India, because of the sheer numbers. So the question is, frankly, who owns data? How do you monetize data? And data privacy. Data privacy, I put it to one side, because there is a general recognition now that the European uh, general data regulation uh, law is uh, not wrong, it's correct. People can tweak it, but that is necessary. So the three other questions really is who owns data, who monetizes data, who benefits from it, and what governments can do to regulate. And that brings me to the last point, which is OECD is in the process of negotiating a digital services tax. France has already announced the 3% digital services tax on GAFA companies. They're holding application of it following American protests. So they said, okay, we we'll wait till the OECD finishes the deal and then do it. UK is going to follow suit as well. Cannot imagine India not doing it. I don't know whether we do 3% less, more, but digital services tax is a reality. Mark Zuckerberg himself now says, governments have to regulate me. I don't think you need to look for an answer anywhere else. If the high priest of internet freedom and data flow tells you the governments need to regulate, we have to regulate. There is no other way. But how we regulate, and for India, the basic thing would be monetization of data. Who benefits from it? That would decide whether we become, at least we have some semblance of digital democracy in this country. Thank you, Mohan, and I would add to that uh, one aspect about India and making yeah, India. Light, light, light. Uh, one of the elements that we need to address is that our sport basket huh? is uh, concentrated, 70% okay. of our export basket is concentrated in the small <laughs> sector. And that's what we need to get into the big so that's one, and also we have to diversify a bit more. So um, maybe India can address that, and also the link to uh, GDC is very, very important. Um, the other question that has been asked is, again to Mohan, uh, President Trump has, I'm glad he's asked you, President Trump has defined U.S. as a developing country. So where does that leave assembly treatment? And consequently, should we get ready for the burial of uh, WTO? So you are making uh, a step too far by saying that if assembly is buried, WTO will be buried. I think I think uh, Arsh and Deepak and others have been saying this. I don't know if they said it explicitly, but let me spell it out to you. The WTO is going nowhere. There is too much money and effort which has been invested in this organization. I think one of the panelists in the morning made a statement, the WTO of tomorrow will bear no resemblance to the WTO of today. That is true. But there is going to be a WTO. The question for developing countries is in, out, what kind of role, what kind of outcome, what kind of obligations will be imposed on you, those are the questions. WTO is going nowhere, so I don't think we should speak. So let me uh, quote or paraphrase Mark Twain by saying, reports of the demise of WTO are vastly exaggerated. So I think it's going nowhere. Now, as far as um, SMD is concerned, um, what we have to see is two things. How much of this is negotiating posture by President Trump vis-a-vis -vis India? 
I will say this frankly, and if there is a Chinese in the audience, please forgive me. My first point of defense will be lumping China and India together, frankly, is deeply insulting to the Chinese. They are a $14 trillion economy. You are a barely $3 trillion economy. So, or somebody has to tell President Trump that, listen, we may belong to the same region, we may both be more than one billion, but there are lots of differences between the two. So that is point number one. Point number two, we will have to see whether the other developed countries follow suit. I hope not. EU and others, because I think they've always been committed to SME. The third thing is that even the Americans are looking at sectors and the Chinese, you know, the Chinese took 15 years to negotiate their accession to the WTO, something that is unparalleled. Most of the other countries took two to three years. It was a very, very hard nosed negotiation. China willingly gave up SND treatment in some sectors. So, even if there is no question of SND being abolished across the board, what could happen eventually? which I hope it doesn't, but one of the things being informally talked about, I was at a conference in Singapore, where people said we would do it sector by sector. So, IT sector, India. You may be told that, listen, there is no justification for you calling yourself a developing country. Pharma. They would say that, listen, you dominate the generic drug market so much that then you really call yourself a developing country. Take any other capital equipment, chemicals, fertilizers. Obviously, India is a developing country because we don't even constitute one percent of trade in those products and those sectors. So that is one way in which the negotiations would go. But for now, I think my sense is uh, I don't want to put the Honorable Commerce Secretary on the mat because he's here. Uh, the negotiations with the United States, I don't know how it will go. But I do sincerely hope the limited phase one will lead to some kind of restoration of the GSP. That is my expectation, sir. But, you know, there are people more qualified speaking to audience. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. And now the next question is to both of us, but I would also uh, invite uh, the ambassador to comment on it. It's, uh, doesn't the rise of developing nations undermine the growth and progress of NDC? How does it play out in the globalization period? And then he goes on to say, example, China being a uh, master in all uh, areas of and all types of production and not allowing LDCs to have their own say or industry. Isn't that basically that's what he's saying that that the rise of developing countries like China is it at sense of the LDCs. Uh, so, Mohan? No, uh, it sounds like a traditional divide and ploy, divide and rule ploy to me. I mean, the LDCs have their own problems, uh, and they are significant problems. The good thing about the structure. Yeah, structure of problems, as you say rightly, man. <laughs> also, I must say this very frankly as well, the LDC issue has been a less contentious issue in the WTO because the World Bank decides the classification. It is not based on self-classification. In fact, Bangladesh, I know, is seriously worried because in two years, the World Bank has said we will, we will graduate you out of the East Development country. So they will lose their present concessions which they get for exporting textiles and garments to EU and so on. So, LDC classification is not self-election and I would say it is less political. Um, if Mr. Mahbubani, Ishwar Mahbubani forgives my, my, shall we say, I'm sorry sir, I'm going to refer to your country. When I reached uh, Geneva in 1992, I heard the Singapore ambassador say we are a developing country. And there were $40,000 per capita. So I remember asking uh, Mr. Kesopani, my good friend from Singapore, I said, listen sir, you got to be a little charitable to me. I'm $800, $900 per capita, you are $40,000. You are saying developing country. I told him jokingly that India should call it a peace developed frankly. So we laughed about it. But since then, of course, a lot of things have happened. Americans have constantly had a problem with countries choosing to declare themselves as them. Malaysia, Singapore in the past, South Korea as well, not just Singapore actually, a whole bunch of countries. And then now, of course, China, India. So there is a political angle to it. 
And that is why in one of my articles I have said clearly, I would rather that we have objective criteria for deciding a developing country. And we can go by the kilometers of highway, the fast speed train, the per capita income, the number of people in poverty. I mean, Kofi Annan said 10 years ago, there are only two regions of the world which have people, large numbers of people, in absolute miserable poverty. He said Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And he jokingly told a human colleague, I'm saying South Asia, but it really is India. He says, I don't want to be impolite to India. So he said South Asia. But obviously everybody understands. South Asia, India is the biggest number. China has abolished extreme poverty. Their own statement and the statement of others who have visited China. So you really cannot compare the two regions, that is Sub-Saharan Africa and India, we have large numbers of people, especially if you use the Oxford. I see a lot of students at the back. You guys should Google the Oxford Initiative on Multidimensional Poverty. Poverty is not the 1,200 calories per month or per day. That's not the measure. There is a multidimensional poverty for po I mean, index of poverty, according to which there are only two regions which have millions and millions of people, which is India and Sub-Saharan Africa. And so I don't see how you can uh, deprive India of SND. That's, that's basically my Thank you, Mohan. I would like to recall what I said earlier about trade being a uh, positive someday. And I would like to say that in the context of LDCs and other developing countries, is definitely a positive someday. And uh, well, Chinese policies in different countries, how they have acted, but they have their investment has helped. They have built infrastructure, I've seen it in Africa. Uh, they, ha they have uh, uh, they are one of the biggest importers of agricultural products from Latin America, for example. Uh, so all of that, and now one of the biggest oil importers from oil producing countries, including uh, some of them uh, are, are the, uh, small LDC. So all of these, both as, as a big importer, as an investor, other other developing countries, the emerging countries, and India, I think, is equally uh, very uh, supportive of. NBC development, both within our region, whether it's Nepal, whether it is Bangladesh, and, and other NBCs, uh, but also in other regions, Africa, our, our party taken Africa, it has a very positive impact. So I don't think it's a zero sum game at all. Um, uh, here I would say the lifting of boats lifts uh, other NBCs. But I would ask uh, Ambassador to also comment on it. There are maybe a few comments. I agree that the uh, discussion on developing countries, the definition that uh, you can uh, elect yourself as a developing country is very much political discussion, very much politicized, but also that's also a very big problem of the whole arena in Geneva because it's really poisonous in a way of discussion. So if we can depoliticize that kind of debate, and that would be extremely helpful. I fully agree that if you don't think you should about certain indicators and try to find a more object objective way of defining a developing country, I think that would be extremely helpful. Not easy, but extremely helpful. That's one. Uh, second, I fully agree. I mean, uh, trade or global trade is definitely not a zero sum game. So it's, uh, if the rise of one country or one group of countries will not be on the cost of the of another group of countries. But of course, trade has an impact and can also be a have very distorted impact, not only in developing countries, but also in developed countries. Uh, the famous study of Aldrich about the China impact in the United States is one of the reasons of the rise of populism. Uh, you see that very much uh, competition in certain regions or in certain industries in a certain economy can have huge impacts so there again, I will come back to domestic policies. Uh, opening up your markets really requires also facilitation of uh, transition processes. And if you do not that in the right way, 
we can have a really a big negative import and impact of international trade. In, in OECD, we did some studies about opening markets and also how much company, uh, how much country spent on labor market policies, social security, and you do see that countries who do have a lot of that kind of policies in place, like the Netherlands or Scandinavian countries, are much better able to facilitate changes as a consequence of globalization. Uh, and I think that's a very good policy choice, uh, which of course requires also strong governments. So that I think that is important, again, to connect opening policies, uh, international trade and investment policies with domestic policies in order to facilitate change so we can better benefit from international markets but also deal with the negative consequences for uh, specific industries, specific companies, or for specific people. And finally, I would very much uh, underline also that imports are as important as exports. Very often our policies are focus on export promotion, but actually we should also do on import promotion. If you make in India, the OECD quite recently published a survey about India, they make a very strong case that uh, having lower lower your applied tariffs in India, uh, dealing with some lower content requirements, will very much help you in the make in India uh, goal. So opening your markets, import, uh, then to be able to export is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, and with that, we end this session. Yes. Thank you all for um, okay. your uh, very interesting questions. Thanks uh, to the panel members. Um, and I think uh, we are the much uh, more enlightened lot after listening to you. And um, I hope this uh, dialogue on the international trading system and uh, developing country participation continues as part of this uh, Asia economic dialogue in the future. Thank you. Can we have a quick round of applause for this panel? Could I request Gay Marshal Bush to go play the town stage to felicitate our panelists? We will start with Ambassador Martin Van Den Thank you, sir. Thank you, panelists, for this wonderful session. Uh, we're going to straight away move into our next session. Could I request my colleague to uh, set the stage appropriately? So that we be asking you to give a video bite, so they will be adopting you. For the next panel, uh, I'm going to read out some of the titles and that.
has the best lost it number one uh, we are an Asia think tank talking about Asia economic dialogue and the question is can Asians think the new Asian hemisphere the great convergence these are some of the titles of books that our next speaker has written before I invite him on stage, I would like to call upon the session chair, Dr. Vivek Debray, to come on stage once again. Dr. Vivek Debray. Dr. Vivek Debray, calling you on stage. Can I have a big round of applause? Because there is no tax, this is a Prashant guy, there is no taxation on clapping, you can keep clapping. And can we have the most wonderful guests that we have invited for this evening address Professor Kishore Nagurbani to come on stage. Professor Kishore Nagurbani, thank you very much for giving us a round of applause. Sir, my colleagues will be here. Sir, the session is over to you and we look forward to the address of Professor Nagurbani. Good afternoon. It's not over to me, it's over to him. All yours. How long do you want to speak for? We need some time, ideally, for questions. 30 minutes is absolutely fine. All yours. Emphasizing how remarkable audience you are. And we are the happy speakers you heard. By now, I will be out of the room. So I hope you don't mind if I begin with a very old joke. You know? Just know, you are the eighth or ninth speaker of the day. I am the eighth or ninth husband of Elizabeth Taylor of Red Knight. And that's my uh, challenge today. But I want to begin, of course, by thanking the National Center and the Ministry of External Affairs for inviting me here to speak to all of you. And I'm really, really delighted to be here. And I want to begin by emphasizing that I'm not a trained specialist. And therefore, I can tell all of you that my remarks are completely on the record. I have nothing to hide. Uh, at the same time, the theme of my remarks can be put in one sentence. Trade is not just about trade. There are many, many dimensions that both affect trade and are affected by trade. And I'm going to talk about these different dimensions. And today I'm going to talk about at least five dimensions. Economics, one. Poverty, two. Geopolitics, three. Peace, four. And cultural confidence, which I think nobody has mentioned so far in the remarks. But as I do so, I will tell you that the perspective I bring to all of you here uh, is from Southeast Asia. So I think I'm the first Southeast Asian voice to come up here. And if at all there's one region that is the most relevant to India, it's Southeast Asia. Why is it the case? Because of the 10 member states of ASEAN, nine of them have what, they have what is called the Indic cultural base. The Indianization of Southeast Asia is still alive. And I can tell you, I was personally shocked when at a very high level summit in November 2017, hosted by Philippines. Now, Philippines, as you know, is the most westernized country in Southeast Asia. They had 300 years of Spanish rule, 50 years of American colonial rule. But when the president was hosting a high-level summit, the Prime Minister Modi was there, Premier Li Keqiang of China was there, Putin was there, and I think Trump was there. What 
cultural performance in the Philippines president put on, on stage? He put on the Ramayana. And even Prime Minister Modi was very surprised. So if a country that is as westernized as Philippines can still remember its Indian heritage, it is alive and well. So it would be good for India to compare itself with the Southeast Asian states and say, how are we doing relative to them? But let me therefore begin with the economics dimension. Now I'm going to begin by saying something that is extremely basic which is that trade is good. And Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage is still working and still doing well. Now, of course, you know why I'm saying it. Because there is a very strong spokesman now saying that Oxen. international trade is bad. Oxen. So in response Oxen. to that, let me just say, I'm not going to give you much data. Let me just give a few examples of states to show how, when you participate in international trade, you are much better off. The classic comparison would be between North Korea and South Korea. And let me say, in, in 1980, and I'm going to use that as a base here, uh, South Korea's GDP was only twice that of North Korea. By 2015, it has become 20 times larger. Why? South Korea participated in international trade. Now, when we compare two successful states, China and India, in 1980, the GNP of China and India was about the same. 191 billion versus 186 billion. By, so one to one. By 2018, China's GNP was five times the size of India. And interestingly, in the same period, when trade was more or less the same, in fact, India had more trade than China in 1980. By 2018, China's trade was four times that of India. Trade leads to prosperity. But the most interesting example I find is from two Southeast Asian states. One, Thailand, had been practicing strong economic development for decades, was at peace, never been colonized, way ahead of Vietnam, that had been fighting wars from 1945 to 1990. And then Vietnam decided to join the global system. And this is what happened. In 1990, that's when Vietnam decided to join, Thailand's GNP was 14 times the size of Vietnam, one four. By 2018, Thailand's GNP was only twice that of Vietnam's. And in the same period, Vietnam's share of international trade became the same as Thailand. That shows you the correlation. If you want prosperity, if you want development, participate in international trade. But the tragedy is that when the data is so clear that that's what we need to do, paradoxically, we live at a time when international trade has never been under greater threat. And it's primarily because of a man called Donald Trump who believed that trade is bad, that trade is a zero-sum game. Now, this is not me speaking. Let me quote to you Professor Robert Lawrence from the Harvard Kennedy School, probably one of the leading authorities on international trade. I interviewed him for my book, actually. And he says, Trump is a mercantilist who fails to understand that exports and imports are both beneficial and that trade balance is determined by macroeconomic forces such as savings and investment rather than trade policies, whether fair or unfair. Instead, Trump views exports as good, imports as bad, and trade balance is a measure whether trade is beneficial and trade policies are successful. 
So this is the danger that we have. We have done so well in, in, with international trade, but this is the moment when it faces great danger. So then let me just turn to poverty. I'm glad that several people have discussed poverty and how poverty has been eradicated. But let me just add to all that by asking you to pause and reflect on just the single biggest fact about our human condition, which is that in the last 30 years, we have done more to improve the human condition than we have in the past 3,000 years. We have lifted so many people out of poverty on a scale that we have never ever done before in human history. And this is what the World Bank says is how global poverty is eliminated. It says trade is central to ending global poverty. Countries that are open to international trade tend to go faster, innovate, improve productivity and provide higher income and more opportunities to people. Open trade also benefits lower income households by offering consumers more affordable goods and services. So, with so much that's been done, one would assume that we would therefore be supporting international trade and not see it under threat. But as I explained earlier, it's diminishing. And so that brings me to my, my third dimension, geopolitics. And I want to emphasize that what you see as developments in international trade are often determined by geopolitical developments. And this is certainly true of the biggest success story that's been repeated over and over in the course of the day to day, and this is of course China. And when we talk of China, everyone talks about how Amazingly, China has transformed itself. Hello. But we haven't mentioned one particular uh, fact. That in some ways, China was a very lucky country. Uh, How was it lucky? Uh, well, as you know, when Mao died in 1976, there was a power struggle between the Gang of Four and the Reformers. The Gang of Four could have won. But the reformers aren't there. And the reformers decide to open up. And then they were doubly lucky. Because when they decided to open up and engage and integrate with the world, the United States welcomed China with open arms. Not because the United States liked China, but because the United States was obsessed with it with the challenge of the Soviet Union, bringing China over to its side, meant that the Soviet Union had a big loss, and therefore the Chinese were given a very generous entry into the American market. And that was pure geopolitics. And if I may make a slightly delicate comparison here, if the United States was courting China in the 70s and 80s. Today, it is courting India for the same geopolitical reasons. But unfortunately, the United States that was open and welcoming to international trade has gone. And it's a very different United States. And you also have to realize that the reason why the United States has become less generous is a result of a fundamental mistake that the United States made at the end of the Cold War. And it's a mistake which I document in my book as the West lost it. 
as having won the Cold War, the United States assumed that it could go on autopilot and not have to adapt or adjust to the world. And that was a mistake because the United States went to sleep at precisely the time when China and India decided to wake up. And so as a consequence of this, the United States became the only major developed country where the average income of the bottom 50%, 50%, went down over a 30-year period. And that explains the political anger in the United States that leads to the election of Donald Trump. That explains the political anger that is behind the political success of Bernie Sanders. So the United States that you're dealing with today is not the generous or giving United States of the 1970s and 1980s. It now has serious domestic challenges to deal with. And that's a new factor that we have to deal with. So for example, if the same visit had happened of an American president to China in the 1980s, there would have been lots of agreements signed. But today we have difficulty concluding a trade agreement with the United States. So that's the new geopolitics. Now let me come to another dimension, peace, before I tie it off, before I tie it off together. The other correlation that is quite remarkable in the world is that just as international trade has been rising, peace has been rising in the world. And there's a Harvard professor whom I quote, Stephen Pinker, who makes a point that today we are probably living in the most peaceful moment of our species time on Earth. Now, of course, there are exceptions, there are parts of the world that really remain trouble, but globally, by and large, the world is becoming more peaceful as a result of the expansion of international trade. And the best evidence of this is given by a part of the world that today should be one of the most troubled parts of the world. And what is that? That's Southeast Asia, right, where I come from. And Southeast Asia is by far, by far, the most diverse corner of planet Earth. Out of 650 million people, you have 250 million Muslims, 150 million Christians, 150 million Buddhists, Mahayana Buddhists, Hinayana Buddhists, you have Hindus, Taoists, Confucianists, Communists. No other region of the world is as diverse as Southeast Asia. And that's why Southeast Asia has been described as the Balkans of Asia. So how is it that a region, the Balkans of Asia, has turned out to be one of the most peaceful and prosperous corners of the world? And that's the result of the decision of the ASEAN countries to open themselves up to the world. I can tell you, I personally attended negotiations among the ASEAN countries on trade in the 1970s. And believe me, they were as frightened of international trade as many developing countries were. Because we were taught in the 1970s. And I know that. When I was ambassador to the UN, I heard the same thing. Right? Trade is bad, investment is bad, exploits third world countries, so we close ourselves up. But progressively, the ASEAN countries opened themselves up. Bit by bit, 
I mean, Indonesia, which has a huge domestic market, was obviously the most reluctant to open itself up. But bit by bit, they found that every time they opened themselves, they did better economically. And that's how you have ASEAN free trade agreement. And what's remarkable is that everybody wants to find sign free trade agreements with ASEAN. China was the first to start. Then Japan said, wow, how can China go ahead of me? Japan did it. South Korea did it. We have some in India, one in India too. And it's Australia and New Zealand. So that example of Southeast Asia, which should be one of the most troubled, conflict-ridden regions of planet Earth, transforming itself to one of the most peaceful regions through opening up, liberalization, connecting with the rest of the world, is a perfect demonstration of how international trade generates peace. And I believe that South Asia, Middle East, any other part of the world can study from this lesson, from this experience. So all this brings me to my fifth, final, and in some ways, the most delicate point, cultural confidence. It's a key factor in decisions made by countries, but it is politically incorrect to discuss it openly. And so I'm going to discuss it by looking at three case studies. The West, China, and India. And it is, there's no doubt that until a decade or two ago, the most culturally confident countries in the world were the Western countries. Again, from personal experience, when I was ambassador to the UN, 1984 to 89, every Western ambassador would go to the UN podium and lecture the world and say, if you want to succeed, open up your economy, trade more, then you will succeed. Why are you closing up your economy? Right? They would support free trade. And that's how the Uruguayana was completed. But since then, right, we watch how the United States has gone from being a champion of free trade to a country that thinks that free trade agreements are bad for it. And it's not just Donald Trump, even Hillary Clinton walked away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So this is a new factor that we have to look at. If you assume that the Western countries will continue to be generous in the way that in the past, that evil is gone. And, that, and you must realize that the politics in both the United States and Europe has changed fundamentally. You have to be a populist or lean towards populism to get elected or to eat to survive. And that's a new thing that's happened. And so when it comes to competition, the Europeans are afraid that if they sign free trade agreements, they will lose out. Then we come the second case study to China. And the Chinese were also, you know, the Chinese went through, as you all know, a hundred years of humiliation. They were not confident they could compete. But one day, Deng Xiaoping asked a very simple and fundamental question. He said, why is it that Chinese overseas are succeeding so well, but Chinese in China are doing so bad? What's the difference? He said the Chinese, overseas Chinese, can compete very well. They can compete in global markets. They can compete in free markets. So why doesn't China try the same? And believe me, when the Chinese opened up, they were not sure what's going to happen. But what happened exceeded their expectations. And today, 
If there's one country that has stepped into the place of the West, it's China, because China will sign a free trade agreement with any country in the world. It's ready. It's not frightened of a free trade agreement. That's cultural confidence. The third case study is India. And if there's one country in the world that should be the most culturally confident about competition, it should be India. Why India? Because the most competitive human laboratory in the world, by far, is the United States of America. The best brains from all, of the world, all over the world, Latin America, China, India, even, rush to go and live and work in the United States. And in that most competitive human laboratory in the world, the most successful ethnic community by far, more successful than the Jewish community, is the Indian community. No other country has nationals running the world's largest corporations, like Microsoft, like Google. So Indians are naturally competitive. And therefore, we should but you should be among the first to say, we can compete. And that would be a major asset, asset that India can bring to the table. So all this brings me to my conclusion, which is that if you look at India's potential today, India is entering an extremely sweet spot on three counts. First, I mentioned geopolitics. India is going to become the most courted country in geopolitics today. Because the next big contest, you know what's coming, is between US and China. And if you can imagine US and China on a seesaw, with China on one side and US on the other side, and if India stands in the middle, India will be the balancing factor in the US-China geopolitical context. Secondly, in terms of cultural confidence, no other country's nationals have done as well as Indian nationals have. And in various dimensions, if you open up competition, Indians will do very well. And the third sweet spot you have is that today you have a very strong domestic government. And you know the record shows that if you don't have a strong domestic government, you cannot cope domestically and globally. But you have the advantage of a very strong government domestically. So with these three factors, Geopolitics, cultural confidence, and a strong government come together, it shows that a tremendous opportunity lies ahead for India. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was wonderful. I'm not sure how we do the q and plenty of time. So is it through the slips is probably better if people directly ask the questions. But while we are arranging for the mics, I have two propositions. They're not really questions for you to react to if you show so wish. The first one in both of these in different kinds of ways cropped up in the earlier sessions, and they have to do obviously with India being in the street form. The first one is the question of inequality. Accepted the correlation between trade and high growth. There also tends to be a correlation between high growth and increasing inequality domestically, however you wish to define it. Personal distribution, spatially, etc. And certainly amongst larger countries, some of the resistance to opening up happens because 
of perceptions about rising inequality across generations, across geographical spectrums, particularly if there is a mismatch between financial sector globalization and real sector globalization. Many of the benefits would probably accrue from the real sector globalization. This is the first. The second one is we talk earlier about India being part of the global supply chain, being integrated into the global economy. But there is also a question of India being integrated domestically. Talked about cross-border movements of labor. Mentioned the US. I'm not talking about the people who are in the zoo. But for the average Indian today, it is not very easy easy to migrate from one state to another, yet globally, even domestic. The US, for example, is perfectly easy to move from one city to another. In India, it's not that easy. And I just mentioned the movements of human labor, but it is true for a whole variety of uh, products and services on this integrate. I'm not saying that as a prerequisite, I'm just presenting it as a problem. In the absence of the domestic integration, and again, probably much more important for large countries, the two need to go hand in hand. How do we handle the questions? The mic goes out. Well, the mic is going out. We can choose to react to these or react to these. Let me just quickly react to the inequality point. And I uh, completely agree with you. That we, when, you can, when countries open up and they globalize, there is rising inequality. But there are two types of inequality. There's one type of inequality where, where countries open up, globalize, and all that. That is growing inequality. The incomes of the top 1% rise, and the incomes of the bottom 10% go down. And in the case of the United States, Income to the bottom 50% went down. That's inequality type A. There's inequality type B, where there is growing inequality. The income to the top 1% go up, but the income to the bottom 10% also go up. Right? And I suggest, you know, in, what I do is I suggest you read the writings of an American philosopher called John Rawls. And John Rawls says at the end of the day, if you want to find out what is a just society, find out what happens to the bottom 10%. So if we create societies as a result of globalization but the income to the bottom 10% go up, then I say this, uh, this is a just uh, outcome. So that's the critical measure. It's not just about inequality, is what happens to the bottom 10%. Okay, I'm just reading this out, but you just responded to it, so please feel free to ignore this. This is from Rashi Mathur. The question is, it is said that globalization makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. In this context, how does one say that free trade reduces poverty without putting limitations to the scope? You can ignore it, you just answered it. Yeah, no, I, 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 want want to to I would also add, there's a tremendous amount of data available on poverty alleviation. And by the way, let me just add, I even though you will not believe it, but when I grew up in Singapore, Singapore was a poor developing country. Of was not for the same as Ghana. I came from a very poor family. I was put in a special feeding program when I was six years old because I was technically undernourished. Now you can see I'm overnourished. But I have personally experienced poverty. And I know how debilitating poverty is. I've therefore also seen what liberation from poverty results in. And the data shows that we have liberated more human beings from poverty in China, in India, in Africa, in the last 30 years as I said, than in the past 3,000 years. So please look at the data to understand how much poverty alleviation.
has taken place. And by the way, when Kofi Annan set up his Millennium Development Goals, the only Millennium Development Goal that Kofi Annan met was the reduction of poverty by half by 2015. We succeeded in that goal. Okay, this is a question from Jagdish Jodhri. You said that trade has had a positive impact with respect to peace on ASEAN countries. Why does the same argument not apply to the Middle East? Sorry, sir. The argument about trade having a positive impact on peace with the ASEAN, uh, why does the same argument not apply to the Middle East? Uh, well, I would say, number one, the Middle East hasn't opened up its economies to trade. There is no free trade agreement among the Middle East countries as there is uh, among the ASEAN countries. Uh, all their participation in international trade, for many of them, the rich ones, is export of oil. And even if you take, for example, the Gulf Cooperation Council, which is the equivalent of ASEAN in the Gulf region, well, despite the fact that they speak the same language, they have the same religion, as you know, uh, Saudi Arabia and UAE have broke off their ties with Qatar. So that's an example of the negative happening. And, and in fact, the Gulf Cooperation Council, if it did what ASEAN did, then you wouldn't have these problems today. Ganesh Nagarajan, you mentioned the cultural confidence of overseas Indians. What, in your opinion, inhibits Indians in India? Uh, I, I think I'm not in a position <laughs> to answer that question. But I can, I can tell you this, as you all know, I'm Indian. Uh, and I will, I'll tell you quite honestly, okay? I'll be very personal and, and biographical. I grew up in a British colony in Singapore. I was born in 1948. The British left Singapore, say, 1963, when I was 15 years old. From the age of 1 to 15, I personally believe in my mind that I was racially inferior to the British. Because they were the superclass, we were the underclass, they were ruling us, and I always assumed that we, we would never do the same. So to me, as an Indian, now to realize that if you have a mathematical com competition, if you have a spelling bee competition in the United States, don't be a British, you have got no chance of winning. You better be Indian. Right? So that transformation in my own mind to realize the cultural confidence is a moving target. And I personally experience it. So, for example, I used to listen to lots of lectures from Anglo-Saxon intellectuals on what's good for Asia. And I assume, oh, these people know better. They should know better than me. And after some time, I came to realize, hey, they don't know. They live in a bubble of their own. So it's, it is a moving target, and I believe that just as you know, the Chinese, I watched the, Chi I watched the cultural confidence of the Chinese transform from the time I went there in 1980 to where it is today. And I'm confident, I think that's, that the cultural confidence of Indians, which is rising globally, will also rise in India, and I'm confident of that. This question slip says email is optional. It does not say the name is optional. I've got an anonymous question. Maybe we should veto it, but I'm still asking you the question. You can, you can veto it because I'm not very sure whether it's meant for you or for me. The question is, why despite strong government, India is still not doing well on the economic front and there has been a slowdown in economic growth? Up to you, thank you. Well, I, 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 you know, the advantage of being fully retired now and, 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 and having no official position of any kind is that I can answer any question. And I actually am very happy to actually engage in debate.
Somebody the other day mentioned in talking in the non debates. I like debates. But sure, you know, the Indian economy has slowed down, but there are various also external factors that affect it. But that's not the critical question. The critical question is what's your prediction for the next 10 years? Right? It's not what happened, it's what we are focused on. Quarter by quarter by quarter is a mistake. Because there will always be downturns and so on and so forth. But the question is are you making the right decisions which will then eventually? restart the thing. And for example, I, I don't know enough about it. Must have surprised to learn from me that there are restrictions on movements of persons within India because I'm not passionately around Mohan, I think talking passionately about it. fact to not quite be Yeah. So so that that's then these are some things that can be fixed. And if you look at it objectively in terms of the opportunities that the global economy has today, there are all kinds of opportunities for Indians to participate in. Tremendous. And, 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 and what's surprising is that if you travel to East Asia, the people in East Asia still, despite all these ups and downs, despite COVID-19, still remain very optimistic, very bullish about the future. So quarter by quarter, I don't know what's going to happen. But we go 10 years from now, when I come back here, to be for the 10th edition of this conference, India will be in a much better spot. Okay. For a change, we are running ahead of time in this session. With the permission of the organizers, perhaps five minutes of live questions without the slips intervening, but please make it uh, Question, not a comment. And make it a short question, then you get a long answer. If you make it a long question, you get a short answer. Five minutes for the floor. Is there a mic? People can shout. No one wants to ask a question. Strong China 
for the next 1,000 years. Okay. How do we take advantage of that? How do we ensure that we too can benefit from all that? And so it is a new, in the field of geopolitics, in the field of human history, it's important to understand there's a whole new game that is starting. And the way that you used to dance in the old games can no longer work in this world. So get now, which has got far more concerns about China than any other country. As it Dr. Dr. Reddy, Titi. Why Dr. Vigran, Dr. Reddy. And that's why it's a thing. And get now realizes that the only solution to living with a strong China as your neighbor is to make sure your own economy is as strong as it's vibrant. And actually the Vietnamese success in economic development, in poverty reduction, is off the charts. Absolutely off the charts. And remarkably, for a country that fought wars from 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, the last war was in China, 1979. After all those decades of war, boom, they become an economic miracle. How did that happen? And so that culture of pragmatism that we created in Southeast Asia rubbed off on Vietnam. And I can tell you something remarkable. Singapore and Vietnam used to fight when I was ambassador to the UN all through the 1980s. The Cold War ended, Vietnam realized the world had changed, Vietnam decided to adapt. Who do they invite to be the economic advisor to Vietnam? Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore. They've been fighting for 10 years, he said that's over, let's adjust, let's adapt, let's move on. So if you can turn on a dime and not be a prisoner all preconceptions, then you can succeed. And that's why Vietnam is so successful. Okay, that's all we have time for. If you, are, if you want answers to the unasked questions, please read these things. Uh, now, can informally? Yes. Could I request Dr. Marshall, the President of the International Centre, to felicitate Dr. Sunil Big round of applause for this wonderful session. Yes.
I'll start with the session chair. Uh, could I have Mr. Anup Vadhavan, former Secretary of Government of India, on the stage? A big round of welcome for Mr. Anup Vadhavan. Could I have Professor Bernard Gopal, the chief medical representative for this particular session on open regionalism? Yeah. And could I have Mr. Sajid Chinna, chief of the economist J.P. Morgan, to come on stage? We also had Mr. Rita Al Saleh from GCC Commercial Arbitration uh, to be part of this session. However, they decided not to travel because of the coronavirus situation. So we have this panel with us, and sir, in the interest of the time, I will straight away hand over the session to you. Thank you so much. My really distinguished fellow panelists, Professor Hoopman and Mr. Sagar Chinoy, I'm extremely happy to be here as a part of this event and as a part of this session. And my thanks to the organizers for making that possible. So I think the, my fellow panelists need no introduction, so let me not lose our time with that. And I think their resumes are available with all of you. Let me also acknowledge the very, very distinguished audience that is there before us, which makes this event particularly challenging and at the same time meaningful. So let me quickly make some introductory remarks and then Pass it on to my distinguished panelists who made their remarks at greater length. So at the outset, let me just try to explain what my understanding of open regionalism is. Regionalism we can see as a level of agglomeration in trade agreements that is between an all-inclusive all multilateralism and a very limited bilateralism to so somewhere between multilateralism and bilateralism calls regionalism. And this agglomeration could be with or without contiguity. It can be across multiple continents. It is essentially bound by rules rather than geography. You have the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you have the Trans-Atlantic Alliance, which is on the anvil, and you have various agreements where the principle of geography is not the basis of the regional agreement. Of course, geographic antiquity is an important determinant. A large number of regional agreements have been shaped by the fact that those countries were bound together by antiquity. Conventional wisdom favors you know, multilateralism as the optimal, ultimate, all-inclusive balanced and equitable goal. It is presumed that something of which everyone is a part will be balanced and equitable. And regionalism to that extent is seen as an interim step towards that ultimate goal or maybe as a necessity in the absence of that ultimate goal being achieved. We can also see it as an instrument for filling gaps in whatever that multilateral you know, arrangement is to the extent that it's not ambitious enough for some countries and regionalism or, you know, agreements of various kinds with suitable partners and bridge that gap in terms of their ambition for greater integration or more liberalized trading arrangements. Is it possible to switch over the light? It's coming right in my eyes. Sorry for that. Yeah. And of course, you know, looking at these trade negotiations, trade agreements broadly, the underlying principles that shape trade agreements, the underlying principles that determine outcomes, all the same in principle across negotiations, whether it's multilateral or regional or bilateral. Of course, the degree of difficulty will vary 
depending on how diverse the countries are in that group, how diverse their ambitions are, how diverse their sensitivities are. And essentially all negotiations are aimed at balancing ambition with sensitivity. Every country has certain ambitions and certain sensitivities. When your ambition comes up against some other country's sensitivity, then you have to reach some balanced middle ground. And to the extent you can find that balanced middle ground, the negotiation concludes. The larger the number of countries, the more diverse the countries, the more different types of balance these conditions and sensitivities. And of course, several instruments that we use to find that balance. You know, instruments which will include, you know, dilution of ambition, finding some middle path, moderate tariffs instead of zero tariffs, tariff rate quotas instead of zero tariffs, less than full reciprocity, um, you know, differentials and deviations from a common concession. I think we saw that in the recent RCEP uh, negotiations. We see that in the various agreements with ASEAN and signed with others, ASEAN agreements with India, we see differentiation across the bilateral pairings. India's concessions from and to the various ASEAN countries, various, very across the entire spectrum. Um, however, let me mention that the scope for diluting ambition in a regional agreement is somewhat limited. Just as a multilateral agreement also, diluting ambition beyond a certain degree becomes difficult, and that is why perhaps multilateralism doesn't has not led to the kind of outcome we targeted. Regionalism is aimed at integration, is aimed at frictionless economic flows between the partners to the extent to dilute their ambition to have duties that are higher than the zero tariffs which you normally aim for, to the extent to have differentiation in duties across the bilateral pairings, to that extent to create frictions in the flow of goods and services, and to that extent the aim of having an integrated regional economy, that aim is diluted, and you know, especially in the present age of global value chains, regional value chains, that is important for countries to dilute ambition beyond a certain degree becomes difficult, and I think We've seen that to some extent in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we've seen that in the RCEP negotiations. Ultimately, it could be happened without the US being part of it. And of course, RCEP is sort of known to all of you, so I will not say much on it. So, to the extent regionalism envisages graduation to higher integration towards multilateralism, it must provide the space for the group and its members to explore and achieve integration outside the regional grouping, as a group or as an individual. And here is where the term open comes in, open regionalism. Regionalism aimed at creating an integrated economy comprising a group of nations, whether contiguous or whether geographically dispersed. And then openness means keeping the door open for extending that sort of integration to additional members who could perhaps accede to the group on the same terms or leaving the door open for the group to sign an agreement with a different grouping or a different country or leaving the door open for individual members to sign agreements with other countries. The examples of all these are there. ASEAN becoming part of RCEP is an example of the entire regional group becoming part of a larger regional group. ASEAN countries like you know, Singapore, Malaysia signing separate agreements with India are examples of individual countries within a regional group seeking greater integration beyond what the ASEAN agreement may allow. So there are numerous Thank examples you. and all these possibilities are open of having open regionalism. There is one example of the EU, the EU where their own integration is 
absolutely complete. In the case of terms of no custom barriers within the EU, in the case of terms of behind the border integration of policies, regulations, rules. So they don't allow individual countries to sign agreements with third countries and then disturb that you know com the comprehensiveness of their own integration. You have one individual country signing something with a third country on terms not acceptable to others, which create a lot of frictions within the EU, so they don't allow that of course. To that extent, it makes the EU an attractive you know, FTA partner for a third country. It is attractive in terms of giving you perfect access to a completely integrated region. So let's say you signing something with Vietnam or you signing something with Canada. To that extent, Canada has complete access into a fully integrated region. So both that, that sort of restriction on individual countries not being able to negotiate a trade agreement as part of EU, the restriction poses a price, but then it also has advantages. Let us say the India ASEAN agreement. The India ASEAN agreement doesn't offer the same kind of integrated access to ASEAN to India because each country pairing has a separate configuration. So, let's look at the challenges in a negotiation. Why do some negotiations succeed and some negotiations fail? I think the key thing is that behind a country's ambitions and sensitivities, there are there is a diverse group of stakeholders. Stakeholders, they could be producers producing primarily for the domestic economy. There will be producers who may be primarily having an export interest. There are traders who are not producers who just want access to goods that they can sell and earn to trade. And of course, they are consumers. So all these stakeholders have diverse interests and typically in a negotiation scenario certain interests are more deeply entrenched, they are more vocal, typically manufacturing interests for the domestic economy are highly entrenched, in some ways quite dominant and very very vocal. Whereas the beneficiary interest sometimes is consumers. In some ways, the biggest beneficiary interest is the consumer who is dispersed, silent, sometimes does not even associate the improvement in his circumstances to a trade agreement. So that, that the silent group which doesn't get mobilized in support of an agreement. So all these things cause complexity. And let me say that without doubt, I think Professor Manuani brought out that point very eloquently. The rules of comparative advantage still prevail. Trade favors higher welfare on the average, which does not mean that everyone gains. There will be some losers, and I think society needs to take care of the losers. And sometimes the losers are highly intense, highly vocal. They have a disproportionate voice, so we have to deal with that. And you know, people who doubt the advantages of trade have to look at, I think, the Indian example. If you look at our position in 1991, since 1991, we've opened up our economy both at an MFM level across the board and also at a bilateral and regional level through our trade agreements. And no one can dispute that our economic circumstances are far, far better today than we were in 1991. And no one can make the claim, you know, no matter how many voices are raised against our FTAs, a lot of people who look at trade deficit figures and say that well, the trade deficit went up, we didn't get as much. All that being said, if you look at it in a macroeconomic sense, we are better off. So, so I don't think there can be doubt. Have some people suffered? Yes. Have we taken adequate care of them? Maybe not. So no one can dispute the fact that 
trade agreements of the bilateral, regional, multilateral will improve welfare in the aggregate for the simple reason that economic agents will have an optimization uh, calculus which works in a less constrained environment, which works in an environment of greater choice. You have greater choice, optimization outcomes will certainly be better and that is the logic behind the use. So I think, and the key thing of course, the key thing is that you have to make yourself domestically strong, put your domestic house in order and then you will have lesser sensitivities, you will have fewer voices opposing openness. I think Professor Mehrubani mentioned that China today can sign any FK. The reason is putting your domestic house in order. Vietnam certainly used successfully with caught up, as was mentioned, with Thailand to a large extent. But the key thing is not opening up to trade. The key thing is putting your domestic house in order. If you put your domestic house in order, you will be able to trade and you will gain from trade. Even if you don't put your domestic house in order fully, even then, I think opening up to trade, you will benefit as well examples of that which I just mentioned. Uh, so this is the first question I'd like to pose for my co panelists How do you and you see, the whole issue of reaching convergence in a negotiation, taking all your stakeholders forward with you, the issue gets more complicated in a democratic framework, it gets more complicated when you have an active, vigilant civil society, a vigilant, aware media, every voice sounds, and to that extent, the challenge becomes much more uh, sort of formidable than it would be otherwise. So my first question is, how do we deal with this issue, especially in the perspective of a democratic society where every voice matters, every voice must be heard, every voice must be satisfied, and you have to take everyone forward in a sustainable manner. How do we deal with those issues? Because the various answers economists have given, safety nets, you know, Emphasis on reclaiming, reskilling, emphasis on simplifying possibilities of restructuring businesses. So all those options are there. So, and of course, if the economy is thriving, if your domestic house is in order, if you are able to offer the world an investment environment that is unmatched, I think that's when you have to look at China and Vietnam, to offer the world an investment environment that is matched, unmatched, you make your you know, task that much easier. So let me pose that the first question. The second question I would like to pose to my co panelists in the hope that we get answers to that is the whole issue of the degree of comprehensiveness and the degree of integration we must aim for in a regional agreement. Comprehensiveness across goods, services, investment, the various rules. Should it be integration at the border, lowering the barriers at the border, or integration beyond the border? That's the EU model. There is some amount of, you know, disenchantment with the EU model that the, with Brexit there, the countries who want the advantage of ease at the border without the obligations of conforming to some common policies, rules, regulations within the border. So is so is that the goal to follow or is it something which is increasingly seen as a difficult you know, task to achieve? So this is one, one aspect, another aspect that I would request my colleagues to respond to. And of course, comprehensiveness across goods, services and investment here again, if you look at you know, our own experience, whether it's RCEP or the other negotiations, trade agreements, integration, normally gets confined to goods. They liberalize goods trade, bring up goods tariffs on 99% of the lines to zero. And to that extent, services 
is neglected, services which is a legitimate part of the comparative advantage of some nations, particularly for India, is a major element of our comparative advantage that services tend to be neglected. You know, there is rhetoric about modern, forward-looking, integrated agreements with minimal barriers, free flow of goods, you know, regional value chains at their peak. Yet, when you talk about the services story and a part of that, with the same very forward-looking, progressive, you know, negotiators, they have a problem with services, especially in the movement of professionals. And the movement of professionals gets confused with immigration, it gets confused with lots of local jobs. There is no a services agreement aims at giving an assurance against policy rollback. It tends to bring on board the existing autonomous regime. For instance, our Indian information technology companies are doing business across the globe. What the trade agreement does is it gives them the security that the present rules will not be rolled back. So when a trade agreement in services society there's not even a ripple on the surface, but nothing changes. Only thing that changes is something on paper that we will not roll back these rules, we will not tomorrow deny you visa, you know, raise H1B fees or end that Australian 458 visa for Indian professionals. So it's only a guarantee against rollback, whereas a goods agreement when your duties are coming down for a country like India from 30 40 percent to zero, there, there is real pain. Your manufacturer who had a protected market with 30 percent duties or 40 percent duties, he feels the pain in reality. So, good trade liberalization takes away jobs. Services trade liberalization, so called liberalization, which protects you from policy rollback, which makes the environment certain rather than liberalizing anything, it doesn't liberalize anything, it only makes the environment certain for the future, it creates jobs. With that assurance, our IT companies, for instance, have created, you know, in the US, I was seeing over 500,000 jobs, which are created by, you know, Indian IT companies. So a lot of times, that forward-looking attitude stops at goods, and all rational arguments are ignored for services, some misplaced arguments confusing it to the immigration, but it is not. It is to enter the movement of professionals for the limited period. There is rotation, there are requirements to go back to home country. To the extent some people immigrate, that is a separate policy which those countries choose to have. That has nothing to do with the trade agreement. Trade agreement doesn't look at immigration. And similarly, the argument that you know, services state will take away jobs is wrong, it creates jobs. One Indian professional creates 10 jobs wherever he goes. And ironically, goods trade liberalization takes away some jobs, it creates others, but takes away some jobs. So let me end with these two questions. How do you engage in negotiations which converts towards a positive conclusion, taking everything, everyone along, every voice along, and how do you aim for the kind of comprehensiveness, you know, about good services, investment rules, uh, which is necessary to achieve the full potential of the gains which will result from, you know, greater integration, greater trade. So thank you and let me now request my fellow panelists to make their demands in turn. Let me request Dr. Bernard Kutman first. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, first time uh, in Pune. It's always a problem when you get asked questions which you don't have a presentation on, but I think some of the questions that have been posed here are, one, highly relevant, and I think there are dimensions of what I'm going to say that link to kind of elements of answers to the questions. My brief was to write a paper on open regionalism, 
And I should confess that I come from a generation of trained economists that has been heavily influenced by people like Professor Jagdish Bhagwati, so that is kind of in my economics DNA, so when I hear the word, re the word regionalism, I'm not particularly uh, enthused. And as I will explain, I think the notion of open regionalism is a bit of a misnomer. So what I'm going to talk about is interpret my brief a bit more broadly and to really focus on the notion of openness as opposed to regionalism in terms of fostering international uh, cooperation. Okay, three stylized facts. The first stylized facts, as you all know, the world is full of regional trade agreements. And in fact, the number of these regional trade agreements, preferential trade agreements, free trade agreements, whatever you want to call them, has been expanding over time and has really begun to take off at the same time that countries began the negotiations in Geneva on the Doha development agenda. So we have this rather strange situation where on the one hand, everyone is saying we're going to negotiate a multilateral trade deal, but on the other hand, if you look at what countries are actually doing, they're busy off negotiating agreements with each other, which are inherently discriminatory. This graph is from the WTO website. One of the things the graph does, which I'm not going to get into, is also look at the depth of these trade agreements. So one of the kind of elements that underlies a lot of the dynamics of regional trade agreements in the last 10 years or so is that they're increasingly dealing with non-trade issues as well. So that's the first fact, a lot of action on the regional front. The second side I start, so I want to mention is if you look at what is happening in the world today, in the last 10 years, if you ask what are governments actually doing on trade policy, on trade related policies, um, basically measures that influence decisions by firms in terms of where to invest, how to produce, where to trade, you find that one, governments have been extremely activist, and what this slide does is collects data from the Global Trade Alert, which is an independent initiative which just looks at our G20 countries living up to the promise they made in 2009 that they were not going to engage in protectionism in a, as a way of getting out of the financial crisis. This effort has been going on now for 10 years, and what you see is one, a lot of action. Many countries are taking many measures every year, and if you try and unpack all of those measures, one thing that jumps out at you from the data is that more than 50%, close to 60% of all the measures that are being taken by G20 countries that could influence trade and competition are subsidies. Either production subsidies, export support measures, often these are not prohibited export subsidies because those will get contested in the WTO, but it's going through the tax system, it's going through trade finance, export credit. Right, so that's, I think, an important side I start to keep in our minds because, of course, a lot of the focus of attention by the United States, also the European Union today, is on China, and China is being seen as a problem in terms of integrating and dealing with the integration of China into the world economy. But at the same time, there is a big agenda where lots of countries are using measures which are either not really compatible with the WTO or <clears throat> are dealing with issue areas which are not covered by the WTO at all. All right, so investment would be an example of this in terms of governments giving incentives for firms to come and invest in my country, not in your country, or in my region within a country, and not somewhere else. Satellite stock number three, we've talked about quite a bit today, is the WTO has largely been missing in action in terms of dealing with the spillovers that are associated with these various types of trade policies. Yeah. Right? And in fact, there's of course an attack on the WTO by the United States in terms of questioning how the WTO operates, pushing for WTO reform. But I think whatever we think about the manner in which the United States is pursuing its goals, I think there's pretty broad agreement that the WTO, and this is just a fact, the WTO was negotiated over 20, 25 years ago. The rules need to be updated. The world economy has really changed. We live in a world where trade and services have been booming or moving towards a digital economy. We're confronted with climate change. There are a large number of really important big issues confronting countries, 
many of which are going to be calling for policies which will affect trade. Whether those effects are intentional or whether they're not intentional. And therefore, there really should be a, a process to actually deal with and think about what are the rules of the game in the 21st century to deal with these agendas. Now, the WTO was stuck, and I'm not going to belabor this point, we've heard about this quite a bit. It's largely because of what has been called the rise of the rest earlier this morning, very much, of course, by the rise of China. And ultimately, what is reflecting the inability of the WTO to actually confront the new agenda, which is increasingly becoming urgent, is that different countries have very different priorities. They have different objectives. And again, as we heard this morning, because of consensus and the consensus decision-making process in the WTO, that means anybody can say no, so it's very difficult to move forward. So the response is that we see to this WTO uh, static, static situation is one, negotiate more regional agreements. That goes back to my stylized fact. Number one, we see lots more negotiations of regional agreements. The second response has been U.S. unilateralism, essentially saying, I don't like where we are, so I'm going to unilaterally start trying to force countries to do what I want them to do. A bit of a problem with the United States approach on this, it's not very clear what they want countries to do, but we see unilateral action being pursued. But I think most of the focus here, of course, is on what the United States is doing. I think there is reason to also worry about what my part of the world might end up doing. I'm a Dutch citizen in the European Union, and of course we've seen lots of articles being discussed in the press about France trying to impose a digital tax, other countries might like pursuing that route. Um, the new commission is going to be focusing much more on dealing with climate change and has said explicitly that trade policy is going to be part of how we are going to deal with reducing uh, emissions, um, like greenhouse gas emissions. So border carbon adjustments are part of that equation. We're going to get to see how this is going to uh, play out. But again, the point here is this is something that is coming from Europe. And Europe is not really doing a whole lot to talk to other countries about this. So in a sense, I'm not saying we're going to be emulating uh, the United States, but there is this unilateral pressure to move on issues that are important for policies domestically. The third uh, response to the situation we're in has been taken by groups of countries in the WTO context to start negotiating on a plurilateral basis. And again, we've heard quite a bit about this already today, and I will come back to this in, in the course of my presentation. And related to that, there are efforts by countries to say, okay, if we cannot, we need to fix the WTO process, because if we cannot use the WTO to deal with these trade conflicts and to deal with the big problems that are heading our way, then the WTO is increasingly going to become irrelevant, and the world might split up into blocks. So regionalism, I think, if we think about what the effects have been of regionalism, I would say on one hand, you could argue there are cause of the current tensions. But if you think about what global value chains do, and why global value chains do what they do, and you look at the data, you very quickly see that global value chains are mostly regional. Right, so most of the specialization in the value chain operates within North America, within Europe, within East Asia. And of course, there's trade across those regions, but they're very much regional. And one reason they're regional is sort of geography, but they're also regional because within the regions the development are done to actually create policy certainty for firms, to reduce barriers to trade, to deal with issues which are important for uh, investment uh, in these uh, various supply chains. So one way of thinking about the globalization backlash is, in a sense, it's also a backlash against this regional integration. Right? And certainly we see this in Europe. Right? So that's one way of thinking about Brexit. It's also a way of thinking about why some of the West European countries are not all that happy with the growth that has been realized in Eastern Europe, right? Because all of that has been driven very much by foreign direct investment and essentially supply chain type um, investment. On the other hand, regional agreements are also a response to the current situation. And we see that quite clearly, I think, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership context, where Japan took the lead to say, okay, even if the United States has withdrawn, we will continue 
to do this. I think that's one interpretation also of the drive to uh, complete the RCEP negotiations. And as was mentioned by, by uh, uh, Mohan Kumar earlier today, you also see that in Africa. Right? So the African continental free trade area that you mentioned is in a sense very much in the self-interest of African countries to pursue, but you can also see that as a bit of self-insurance, as a reaction to what is happening in the global economy. So regional integration, I think, is extremely useful, certainly for countries within the particular region, the reasons that we heard uh, today, and which I fully endorse. But on the other hand, if you think about regional agreements as a way of dealing with the problems we face today, they're very much second best or end best instruments, and in some areas are simply not fit for purpose. Right? So if we think about global climate change, if we think about global collective action problems, we're not going to deal with this through regional trade agreements. So just quickly, problems with regional agreements is they are discriminatory, they don't have accession mechanisms. Right, so the CPTPP is rather unique in saying, well, we will accept and we encourage other countries to join. But most regional agreements, most trade agreements are simply closed. And one of the reasons we have that explosion of free trade agreements that we get from the WTO website is because they're closed. So if two countries have signed an agreement, a third country cannot join that agreement. It has to negotiate separately with those countries. So that's part of the equation. They're also difficult to negotiate, and I think this goes to the question that was posed on this, because increasingly they deal with non-trade issues. And as soon as you start dealing with non-trade issues, you're dealing with domestic social preferences, you're dealing with a much greater variety of stakeholders who are involved. And part of the problem here is, is that quite frequently there's going to be asymmetric power relationships. Right? So the European Union, when it negotiates trade agreements, it actually, the, the negotiators are required to insert labor standards, provisions, provisions on environmental protection, provisions on human rights. And that's not because the negotiators themselves necessarily want to do this. They're required to do it by the Treaty of Lisbon. And of course, that makes it a lot harder to negotiate these agreements. As I mentioned, they don't address these sources, the major sources, I think, of the trade conflicts today, which have to do with subsidies, which have to do with climate change. And I think very importantly, they don't include countries like India, they don't really include countries like China, so there are lots of agreements that China has signed around the world with partners, but they don't really get into subsidies, they don't get into the difficult questions which are causing trade conflicts, so in that sense they can't really help us. I would argue that the reaction agreements, which were discussed by Harsha Singh this morning, are one way forward of thinking about how do we kind of build bridges between regional agreements and multilateral approaches in a world where multilateral approaches are increasingly difficult to get to yes. Right? It's very difficult to get 164 countries to agree on anything, and I think in today's environment where there is an absence of trust among WTO members, we can't really think about pushing forward along the lines of what we did in the 1980s and 1990s. So, let me briefly just say advantages of this approach. So one advantage of the approach is it actually allows countries with different preferences to say no. It allows the countries that want to move forward on a particular area to move forward. And I think one of the problems we've had in the WTO is that we've talked about this at length in terms of development, especially differential treatment, we have very heterogeneous countries in the world economy. They very naturally have different priorities and objectives. So therefore, it doesn't really make much sense, as was already said by uh, Dr. Kumar, that we shouldn't have one size fits all for everyone on all issues. So very actual approaches actually allow for much more flexibility. And I think importantly, what they do is they also allow countries to make a distinction between market access which is what trade agreements, free trade agreements are really all about, and regulatory cooperation. And a lot of the issues that confront business today, in terms of what they would like to see governments do, in terms of facilitating trade, really have to do with regulation. They have to do with differences in regulation, regulatory heterogeneity. They don't necessarily have to do with discrimination of the traditional type that we see 
the trade policy and the trade agreements are really all about. So I think that's a big advantage of the periodical um, agenda. And as long as those agreements are applied on a non-discriminatory basis to countries that are not part of them, there isn't a big concern from a multilateral perspective, um, I would argue. So they're consistent with a multilateral trading system. And in fact, that's how the multilateral trading system has always worked, by right? groups of countries getting together, taking the lead in an area, and moving forward, but applying whatever gets done on a most favored nation basis. Now, plurilateral agreements are not a magic wand which will solve all of our problems, right? And that's certainly not what I am arguing, but what I would argue is that they really are an effective alternative to regional trade agreements. And if you really think about open regionalism and what open regionalism, the people who invented the phrase, uh, it was Fred Bergson who, who uh, I think, invented the term open regionalism, it was really about open in the sense that anybody could participate in it. And I think this is something the plurilateral track in the WTO can actually offer two countries. Now that's not going to be automatic, and I think it's very important that the countries, all the members of the WTO, actually ensure that these agreements are indeed open. And all the members of those agreements to account to ensure that you actually can join them down the road if a country wants to join, and to make sure that the terms don't change, that the incumbents don't suddenly say, if you want to join now, you have to pay twice what I paid today to this agreement. Right? So there are real, I think, important governance challenges in terms of making this work in a multilateral setting, but I think there's a lot of advantages to the approach that uh, imply that they're actually a useful um, mechanism for countries to cooperate on, on a really wide variety uh, of issues. And we're seeing this happening both in the WTO, and we're also seeing it happen in, in parallel. If you think about climate change, if you think about the Paris Agreement, essentially what we're seeing countries now do is they start to cooperate in clubs. Right? So there's a whole literature on climate clubs, which is really all about plurilateral cooperation, where countries cooperate to say, okay, we're going to jointly try and achieve the objectives that we set for ourselves in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to help each other do that. New Zealand has just launched an initiative where they're actually trying to figure out how does trade and sustainable development uh, fit together, right? And they're doing that on a plurilateral basis. So lots of flexibility in terms of dealing with important questions. If you ask, if you think about this, will be my final uh, point. Next, next to the final slide. If you look at what's going on right now, so right now there are four negotiations going on on particular issues on a plurilateral basis. They deal with investment facilitation, e-commerce, domestic regulation of services, and trying to identify what could be done to actually help micro and small medium-sized firms use the trading system. Right? Those are all done plurilaterally. If you think about what is on the agenda, what is on the table in those discussions, in terms of substance, there's only one agreement that deals with market access, and that's e-commerce. And because there are, there is an important dimension there where policies are actually discriminatory, and countries are trying to negotiate rules of the game on that. Whether they'll be successful, we'll have to see. My prediction is they're not going to be particularly successful where they can be successful on e-commerce is to deal with issues that are really about trade facilitation. Right? How do we deal with electronic signatures? How do we facilitate electronic payments? So there's a whole slew of things where it actually makes sense to cooperate which will immediately benefit business and which is not particularly painful in the sense that we're not talking about liberalization. Same thing with investment facilitation. This is all about trying to figure out what is good practice to actually encourage investment to come into the country, how do we manage that, how do we regulate that? It's not about liberalization per se. Domestic regulation, by definition, is not about liberalization. It's really about trying to identify good practices in how you regulate services, and that is what we're trying to do. So I think these are examples of agreements, potential agreements, and they're being pursued, I think, partly or even largely, potentially, 
because we don't have this complicated market access I mentioned, where it becomes really important who's part of the agreement. But on the other hand, these are going to be, if they are successful, agreements which will establish what is good practice. And the countries who are not at the table will not going to have a voice in trying to identify what makes for good practice. One of the things that really strikes me when I look at the current set of actual discussions in the WTO is that they very much respond to an agenda that India put forward in 2016. So when the trade facilitation agreement for goods was negotiated, a few years later, India said, well, we should do this for services. Right? There's no facilitation agreement on services, so they put forward a proposal to the government to push this on the table at the WTO. They were not successful at the time, for reasons I'm sure other people in the room here know much better than I do, but I think if you look at the, the substance of what is being discussed now, you could say, well, to a large extent, that actually is a services facilitation agenda. Right, which raises the question then, uh, why India is not participating, which our child will come to next. So this is my last slide. So I think, just to finish with a few thoughts about India, given that we are India, I think one of the things that is clear about India's position in the WTO is it's been very active, been pretty much from day one. I joined the GATT in 1988, I think at the same time Harsha did. India was a real presence in the negotiations. India was a real presence in the Secretariat. I still remember with some the fear that my boss used to have when he had to talk to the Deputy Director General who ran the GATT Secretariat, Mr. Matur, who was obviously, he was very, impressive person um, in terms of being engaged. But India is a multilateralist, right? And we heard this today. India doesn't have many uh, trade agreements. It certainly doesn't have many of the deep free trade agreements that are being negotiated by the European Union and other countries. But India, because it is such a committed multilateralist, has also been quite opposed to joining in these plurilateral discussions. And I think, and again, People in this room are going to know infinitely more about this than I do, but I, I would interpret this partly as a matter of principle, in terms of what they, what India is in, should be pursued in the WTO. And I think also, this might be a bit more debatable, I think one of the reasons for opposition is if you go down this track of trying to deal with things on an issue-by-issue -issue basis, you kind of lose leverage. Right, so you can't then engage in process with linkages to try and get progress on things that you care much more about than what that particular agreement might be doing. And this is, I think, a real, uh, a real world kind of uh, implication of going down the blurry actual path that simply does become a lot easier to do, a lot more difficult uh, to do. I would argue that, especially given the agenda items that are being pursued right now, and given that they're so closely related to services, and this goes to also the question on services and the difficulties of liberalizing services, one of the reasons for that, I would argue, is that you do need to get your domestic house in order. And this is a necessary condition for benefiting from liberalization. And a large part of the agenda that is being discussed now at WTO is actually not helping you get the domestic house in order because it really is about what makes for good regulatory practices, what are the constraints to adopting those good regulatory practices, what can we learn from other countries and the experience of other countries in improving regulation. So I think that is something I would, uh, I guess it's more a question than, than anything else, but certainly my advice would be to reconsider not being uh, at the table in these, in these initiatives and also because if you look forward, the name of the game in terms of trade cooperation increasingly is all about regulation. And I think we have a choice, collective choice. Either we pursue that through regional agreements, which is where a lot of the action is actually happening, or we try and bring some of that into the building you know, through a trilateral process, which I would argue makes sense because many countries are simply not on the same page. They do have different priorities. And the big advantage of doing it through open, very actual agreements in the WTO is precisely that they are open, and precisely because they are going to have to be applied on a non-discriminatory 
basis. Because otherwise, the countries that are not part of these agreements will never accept that they become part of the WTO. So I think there is a real opportunity here. I think we do need to think about the governance of these agreements, but I think that is something that needs to be addressed, especially by the countries that are involved in these agreements. But <clears throat> I would argue, if we don't go down this track, we're not going to end up in a world of open regionalism. We're going to end up in a world of closed regional blocks where the world economy will splinter into those blocks. And that clearly is not somewhere that we want to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoffman. You have very comprehensive and insightful remarks. Let me now request my other very distinguished co panelists, Mr. Sajid Shimoy, Dr. Sajid Shimoy, to make remarks. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, so thank you for inviting me. Um, both Mr. Madhavan and Bernard have made very comprehensive uh, conceptual comments, so I'm going to perhaps to complement them, uh, limit myself uh, to, the, to make the, the macro case for exports and free trade in India, give them a macro economics. And let me start with you know, foundational issues, because we live in a world where uh, in, you know, and Bernard hinted at this, where the G3 countries and Gulf countries, protectionism is increasingly digitalized. And so there are two propositions that people in India face. One is something that the economic survey has pointed out. We believe that no country in the world in known history has grown at 7 or 8 or 9 or 10 percent without having strong exports growth. And this is a empirical fact. And if India has to grow at 8 to 9 or 10 percent, which we do over the next 10 years, 20 years, it will have to be based on an export driven strategy. But the other proposition that is tempting at this point in time is to say, does that really apply to India? This export investment mix is really, you know, typical of small open economies. India has a large market, we continental size. Can't we just invest? for our domestic population, especially when there's so much export pessimism, uh, we're increasing protection, uh, non-tariff barriers, we've heard the WTO is becoming dysfunctional. Uh, it's too much hassle. Why don't we focus on the domestic market? So I would try and rebut the second hypothesis, both theoretically and empirically to say that the case, I would argue, even for unilateral trade liberalization is still very strong if we find that regional and multilateral arrangements aren't working. So let's make the theoretical case a very simple one. I think all of us agree that investment is the only sustainable driver of growth. Right? But if you have strong investment rates in emerging markets which face constraints on your external sector, you have to have a commensurately strong savings rate. Right? Because if your investment rate is high and your savings rate does not keep up, then you have what we economists call a large current account deficit, which is simply the difference between investment and savings. And unless you're in the US, where you've got exorbitant privilege, where there's this natural demand for dollars, unlike that situation in emerging markets, there are levels beyond which the current account deficit cannot go. In India's case, that level is usually seen at about 2.5% of GDP. That to get capital flows beyond 2.5% of GDP in all states of nature is difficult, and therefore we should limit our current account to about 2.5%. So let me go back to the initial proposition. If you've got that external constraint, and investment has to rise, then savings has to rise in tandem to ensure that the current account doesn't balloon. But if savings rises in tandem, then by definition, consumption to GDP must be falling by construction. But if consumption to GDP is falling, which means consumption is growing less than GDP, then why will investment to GDP rising? Why will people be investing at rates higher than GDP growth if consumption to GDP is falling? If and only if exports are rising. So the macroeconomic case for why you have to have this synergy of investment and exports is axiomatic. 
And this is the tyranny of macroeconomic identities, which is why for 30 years the Asian economies benefited because they had this dualism of exports and investment. And which is why the Latin American economies, which strive consumption driven growth, A have seen no growth and B have seen these boom bust cycles. Right? So, just to, for all of us to understand, consumption by itself cannot drive growth for decades or years on end because inevitably it will come up against a current account deficit constraint. That is why when you talk about growth rates for 10 years, for 20 years, it has to be uh, this combination of exports and investment. So that's the theoretical case. Now the empirical case I think is quite striking. All of us believe that India is still a relatively close economy, large domestic market, we have this much wanted consumption cycle. But if you just go back to recent history, you understand that's not the case. Between 2000 and 2008, 1999 to 2008 to be precise, in those 10 years, as Mr. Radwan hinted, exports were surging. They were growing at 18% year in real terms for a decade in India. Now, to be fair, this was the period of hyper globalization, so all emerging markets were benefiting. But look at this first chart. This is India's export to GDP ratio. Right? Between 2000 and 2011, we've gone from about 10% of GDP to 25% of GDP. At our peak, exports to GDP was the same level as Indonesia. And nobody would claim Indonesia is a particularly close economy. So in fact, India has gone to a huge burst of exports. And guess what the next line is on the same chart? It's investment. So India also had the same dualism between 2000 and 2012 where you had very strong export growth and the manifestation of that, that shows up in several companies very much early in Pune, this is my hometown and so I know. Uh, so exports are very strong and because it's strong external demand for a decade, guess what? India has its first private investment capacity creation cycle. Right? Investment is growing at 12% a year, exports are growing at 18% a year, and consumption actually is growing at just 6.5% a year. So India, in a way, strangely, looks very much like China. And this is shocking to most people. The left hand side chart, most people understand the Chinese story very well. That you had rising exports, you had rising investment to the global financial crisis, and consumption to GDP was actually falling. Then post the global financial crisis, China begins to rebalance. Right? There is this export pessimism, global growth slows, so Chinese exports come down, there's overinvestment, so investment comes down, and consumption begins to rise, rise as a policy choice in China. But guess what? The right hand side is India, and the lines look virtually identical. The levels are different, very different. But if I were to cover both the axis, it's hard to separate India from China. Because between 95 and 2012, we went through the same cycle I just spoke about. Very strong export growth, driving a capex cycle. Consumption as a share of GDP is still the largest in level terms, but it's actually falling as a share of GDP until the global financial crisis. Then the world changes, low global growth, much less trade, more protectionism, and just like in China, India's had to rely on stronger consumption growth, exports to GDP have fallen, and investment to GDP has fallen. So the first point is, less than 20 years ago, India was able to prove to itself that you were a decade of 8-9% growth, relying on this combination of investment and exports. Now that's the macro story. The micro story is almost more impressive. Because people think in those 10 years, this was just IT exports. It wasn't. Merchandise exports in those 10 years grew stronger than I, uh, IT exports. But the structure of our exports changed dramatically. In 2000, if you take out oil from our export basket, basically the old Indian exports used to dominate textile, leather, gems and jewelry, which are more sluggish to grow to growth. By 2010, guess what? 60% of our non oil merchandise export basket was engineering goods, capital goods, pharmaceuticals, auto parts. So we had moved up the value chain and the entire basket had changed. The good news was these were 
higher value I had. The not so good news was these were much more cyclical in that they were much more sensitive to global growth impulses. So in good years, actually goods boom. In the not so good years, you have a significant slowdown, whereas in case old exports, textile, leather, gems, and jewelry are, are more sluggish uh, across business cycles. So my short, my first point I wanted to make is that we've actually seen uh, uh, India's far more open economy than we believe. We've relied on the export engine uh, 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 meaningfully in the past, uh, and the structure of India's exports are quite different from what we believe. Let me just step back uh, for a second to talk about kind of three phases of India's growth, and then talk about uh, the future. You know, if you, if you bring the growth in India down the last 20 years, I spoke about this first phase between 97 and 2007, you see the orange line, export is very strong, uh, you know, investment follows as a consequence. Uh, the phase, second phase was, I think, uh, less sustainable. This was post the global financial crisis in 2012. Exports had slowed, investment had slowed, but you saw a very large policy stimulus. Fiscal policy was very expansive, real interest rates were negative. And as a consequence, I think policy was so stimulative that it threw the economy over the edge and we had a paper tantrum in 2013. The last phase of growth in the last six years has been driven largely by consumption. Both by private consumption and by public consumption has been strong. But all of us today are bemoaning is we need more investment. Right? And the common hypothesis is investment may not pick up because uh, uh, you've got balance sheet problems. And I think that's actually a view that's five years old. If you look at the data carefully, what you find today is balance sheets have improved quite dramatically uh, 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 across uh, many sectors. Corporate debt to GDP has actually fallen in the last six, seven years, and balance sheets are much more geared towards another investment cycle. The constraint is not balance sheets, the constraint is demand. You look at capacity utilization in India, that's now down to below 70% which is the lowest in more than a decade. So if we want investment, we really need demand to pick up. And there are kind of three sources of demand. We've seen consumption the last five or six years, uh, which has its limits because the private consumption that we saw in the last five years has been driven by household leverage. Household debt has gone up from 18% to 30% in the last five years. And there are limits as to how much leverage can increase, so there will be limits to consumption growth. The government's focused hard on infrastructure, but given fiscal constraints, there's an issue with infrastructure, which then leaves us with the only third driver of demand, exports. So I'm coming back to where we started, that if India needs to see another investment cycle, it will have to be on the back of strong exports in the next five or six years. And so the question is, how do we in this environment engender strong exports. I would argue that uh, we're, we're witnessing kind of once in a generation opportunity. I'm sure this has come out in the conference before, but the fact is, you know, uh, the, the US China trade frictions over the last two years has meant a secular movement of the supply chain outside of China. If you look at the left hand side chart, you see the share of exports to the US. Even Asia, emerging market Asia has come off very sharply, so other parts of the world are benefiting. And within Asia, of course, you see a big drop off in the Chinese share. So multinational corporations are moving outside of China, trying to get the supply chain to be more diversified outside of China. And so far, they've gone to Vietnam, they've gone to Taiwan, there's a little bit to India, but this is India's opportunity. Because these firms will move every 30 years. They're moving out of China and they're looking for other destinations in India. Now, Vietnam, we've heard wonderful things about them, and I agree, it's a dynamic story, but it just doesn't have the absorptive capacity of the business leaving out in China. Neither Vietnam nor Taiwan have the scale and the size to absorb the supply chain that's moving out of China. Only India in the region has the scale and the size. So, really, You've got to combine these things that if the investment cycle should pick up, we need exports to pick up. We can either be uh, 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 you know, uh, focused on global protectionism and, 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 and frictions, or we can focus on the opportunities 
uh, uh, that a relocating supply chain are having within Asia. So I think the question is, how do you seize the opportunity? Uh, Mr. Barna rightly said, how do we get our house in order? I'm going to make three propositions uh, and then end. Um, uh, 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 how can we attract some of this business? Uh, first is, uh, there's a recent UN report which talks about how special export zones, special economic zones around the world have proliferated even more in the last 10 years and still offer perhaps the best gateway to joining global value chains. And perhaps we need to go back and revisit that framework, which is start with one or two special economic zones. Let me make this very simplistic just for the purpose of illustration and say, suppose we go to Gujarat and we say the government says we acquire 100,000 acres of land in Gujarat. Gujarat's a very good infrastructure. In that 100,000 acres, there are no labor laws that apply. There's excellent transport infrastructure, uh, good connectivity to the port, and now corporate tax rates have come down. So we basically, rather than factor market reforms in the entire country, which are politically much more daunting, we just start by doing them in one special economic zone in the hope of attracting two or three multinational corporations from China to India to produce in that zone and hopefully come to the conclusion that if India has lower real wages with no labor laws in that, in that zone, with good connectivity to the port, with low corporate tax rates, and with good transportation logistics, you know what? If India can compete with other countries in the region, at least in the zone, if one such zone succeeds, I want to emphasize the demonstration effect that has, uh, both on other companies that would like to move to India once they realize that India is competitive, or to other states in the union that would say, if that zone is getting more FDI, more investment, and more jobs, why can't we do it in Maharashtra or do it in in, in Karnataka or the West. So I think rather than trying to solve all of our problems at the same time, maybe we can just go back to first principles and do what other countries have done. Pick one or two zones, ensure that we get the factory market reforms there, but do it soon because these companies are making decisions every week and every month over the next year about relocating that supply zone. The second uh, suggestion I have, which is a little bit more tactical, is the exchange rate. Um, I had presented a paper uh, back in 2018 with the Indian Policy Forum saying that uh, there's a lot of empirical evidence now, uh, including some work we did, but exchange rates actually matter hugely to exports. And uh, if you look at India's trade weighted real effective exchange rate, you've seen about a 15% real appreciation over the last six to seven years. Now, to be fair, this is despite the fact that policymakers have tried very hard to prevent depreciation. The real effective exchange rate is ultimately determined by fundamentals. When oil prices collapsed from $130 down to $40 a barrel, that was a huge positive terms of trade shock for India. Economic theory would argue your real effective exchange rate would appreciate in response and it did. And it's only 20% depreciation. Capital flows have been very strong in India, that's caused more appreciation. But the problem is that appreciation is making our very exports less competitive. And what we found in our analysis in 2018 was a significant amount of the export slowdown in recent years can be explained by a stronger rupee. Now, to be fair, um, the central bank, the RBI, has been intervening very aggressively to prevent rupee appreciation to their credit. So policymakers are doing everything possible to ensure that rupee gets strengthened further. But it's important that industry and market participants not conflate a stronger rupee with a stronger economy. If anything, if we want to compete uh, in global value chains, uh, in the export uh, world, have uh, benefits of trade, uh, we need to ensure that this, the rupee does not uh, uh, get uh, uh, overvalued. The third point I want to make, so the first is special ec uh, economic zones, the second is on the currency, the third is on import tariffs, you know, all of us who study trade uh, start with the, the learner symmetry theorem that really an import tariff is uh, 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 observationally equivalent to an export tax. And so we need to be very careful uh, of that um, 
that uh, we don't impose the import tariffs we made at the very level. Now, this is not easy. It's easy for me to stand here and say it. One of the reasons why we are contemplating whether or not the trans asset is, you know, we have a large bilateral trade deficit with China. If you just look at India's non-oil, non-coal merchandise trade deficit, the total deficit is about 1.8% of GDP. Our deficit with China alone is 2.3%. In other words, the entire deficit and then some comes with one country. With the rest of the world, we have a surplus. We're like Germany. You see, imports from China have picked up very sharply, exports to China have come up. So, so sequencing here will be necessary before we join uh, free trade agreements to ensure that the dislocation impacts of trade are minimized. But this is a this is a real issue. Let me conclude by um, let me conclude by making one final point, which is uh, there is still um, people are agnostic about the fact, about India's performance in regional trade agreements. Um, some people will point to the fact that India has lost, even though, as Bernard said, we're part of very few agreements. And that is not correct. The Economic Survey this year has done some very careful work analyzing, given the limited number of free trade agreements we have, uh, how India has benefited. And what you find is merchandise exports. So you need a very narrow, mercantilist view of the world that I'm going to measure the value of my free trade agreements, not by allocative efficiency, not by the welfare that Mr. Wagner rightly spoke about, but you know, we take a Trump view of the world, has my trade deficit gotten wider or narrower? Even if you take a very narrow market view, what you find is, in most free trade agreements, India's merchandise exports have, uh, have grown more strongly than merchandise imports have. So on net controlling for other factors, India has actually benefited. Let me therefore close by saying that I think the macro case for growth driven by exports is as true as it's ever been. India will not be able to grow uh, at 8 or 9 or 10 percent for any length of time if it's not driven by exports, it's driven entirely by consumption, because as Latin America has found out, that is unsustainable. The question we have to ask ourselves is how do we boost exports in the coming years? My suggestions are made, special economic zones to ensure import tariffs are competitive and ensure that the exchange rate is, is not working to our disadvantage. Uh, and so whether we, whether we join regional free trade agreements, the multilateral agreements, I would argue, even the case for unilateral trade liberalization is still very strong. We end by, uh, uh, Quoting what Adam Smith said almost 300 years ago, which is every man ultimately lives by exchanging. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your very, very illuminating remarks and for some very practical suggestions on how we can achieve the objectives of growth and you know, great openness and small promotions. So thank you so much for the very, very useful remarks. I think we will be good speakers. We will cover a lot of ground very, very comprehensively. I think we have done very well for time also. Thanks partly to one of the speakers not being there. So we have three questions. Let me, I think we have time for all three of them. The first question is, how can plurilateralism compensate for the obvious geographical advantages of regionalism? This is for Professor Kukman. Yes, yeah, so I don't think it's an issue of, of compensating. So I think these two, <coughs> these are complementary kind of approaches. But clearly, I, I think there was, it also put up in the previous session, the question about Thailand and Vietnam. Well, obviously, where you are does make a difference. If you're in the middle of Africa, it's going to be much more difficult to benefit from regional integration, simply because you don't have Germany next door, you don't have the United States next door, you don't have China next door. I think that, that is an important kind of driver of regional integration. And I think it's one that has been shown to be extremely successful, because we've seen the development in those different regions. 
I think we're very apt for cooperation and complement. The regional agenda is partly by saying some of those things that are being done in regional agreements, which have nothing to do with market access per se, we can actually do that more generally. And I think that's one of the advantages of the third doctrinal approach. You can add that. And that's what's going on today. That's what I was trying to point I was trying to make because of what's happening right now. Is it okay? You know, you can actually deal with particular issue areas which relate very much to getting your domestic house in order, which is really all about trying to figure out what does that mean, how do you do that well, what do you learn from other countries' experiences. And in the process, try to figure out where, if we put this in an agreement, does it actually help us do what we decided for ourselves actually make sense to do. Right? And then that helps kind of the implementation process. And <clears throat> I think that's one reason to think about doing this in a in a, in a very absolute type of setting. But yeah, I would say the two are complementary, but I would also reiterate that some of the big, really big ticket items that are confronted in the world economy are never going to be dealt with through regional trade agreements because they're simply not designed to do that because partly you're worried about spillovers, so therefore we do need to have a multilateral approach. And that I think is one of the kind of limits of the regional process. But as far as regional integration is really a, a, a type of deeply integrated markets, I think that is, of course, a big boost to the type of agenda that has been talked about in terms of promoting exports and global investment. The second question is from Mr. Sudhir Mehta. It says, how does Asia, especially India, look to engage with Africa? Except China, Asia has failed to engage with Africa despite with this the population and availability of various factors. So let me try to answer that. You see, the choice variable is not engaging with Africa. The choice variable is not that I want to boost my exports. The choices which policy makers have are putting your domestic house in order, creating an environment for investment that is competitive, that is undisorted, creating an environment for entrepreneurs which they can drive. And when that happens, entrepreneurs have optimized their goals, they optimize the goals at a macro level for the economy. The choice value right now is not that I want to boost my exports. The choice value is how to create an environment where your economic agents from making the process and the drive. And some of the answers given by <laughs> Dr. Shinoi that you create an investment environment, you can't create it at a countrywide level in one go to some geographical areas where you provide the best investment environment in the world, not only for the world investor, but also for the global investor. And then all the outcomes will result whether entrepreneurs export to Africa or they export to China or they export to the US or the EU. All that will follow, whether it becomes part of global value chains. For instance, you know, a lot of people say we should become part of global value chains. That is not a choice that is put in my hands or anyone's hands. It's, it's just a wish. How will you become part of global value chains? By creating efficiency in your system. Smooth flow of goods and services. Quick turnaround times in terms of logistics efficiency. You put all the things in place then all those opportunities will materialize and reach out to the need to distinguish as to what are the choice variables we have. Choice variables are in one class which is putting your, making your economy competitive and making your environment competitive for your economic agents. And then they will make the choices. They will have to have something else, they will decide. You want to add to that? The third question is says India already has about 220 SC reds. Why aren't they achieving the kind of impact that Dr. Shimon had in mind? So let me pass it on to Dr. Shimon. Thank you very much, Sean. And it's a good point, and I anticipated that. Um, it's not all SC reds uh, uh, um, succeed. Uh, some, unfortunately, given the regulatory environment, we'll see more as land grabs than they were. But I think we should not be constrained by the past. The fact is, as Robert I think said, to compete, India would have to do these fact and market reforms. And it's too much, politically too daunting, to attend this at a national level. So we have to recraft 
in my view, uh, the regulatory environment uh, for these entities, even a different name or acronym, that's uh, a segue to a fresh start. But ultimately, what are we talking about? A, a limited expanse of land, where land acquisition is not a constraint, where labor laws are not binding, where transformation infrastructure, uh, uh, infrastructure is world class, so you've got port connectivity, you've already got the corporate tax stuff. Right? So all we have to do is concentrate these synergies in one place. Uh, what is the number? Is it eight provinces in China account for 85% of export, or used to 85% of export to, 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 to the US? Right? So it's so very, even in China, you've seen this very focused area where there are economies of agglomeration, economies of scale that are narrowly concentrated in areas that are deemed to have some kind of advantage. I think that's the approach in should start. Let's not be held back to the past and, and turn a fresh leaf uh, to exploit the opportunity that disappear in a couple of years as these multinational firms attempt to relocate uh, within Asia. Let me know the secret. I used to be the joint secretary handling SCBEX, and I'm now in the department which still handles SCBEX. And I would have liked to answer it, but that's a one very complimentary to me myself. <laughs> but uh, I think over the course of what we said today, the answer is there. You have to create an environment which is competitive to the extent our SCBEX model. We have not achieved the same success as others, we need to reform it, we need to fix it. And I think the, the answers are well known, so let me not elaborate right now. There is one final question, which again, I think I will be able to answer against my better judgment. It says, despite so much intellectual capacity in India, why have we lost our way on FTA and trade? Why do we persist with? We work in new structures, lopsided FTAs, and a lot of countries like Vietnam and Bangladesh to get ahead of us. How do we change the whole paradigm? There can, I think, the answers to some of these questions that to create pockets of success. You know what Dr. Chanon mentioned, create pockets of success slowly, allow them to assume greater and greater economic importance, greater size, and once you have a successful two pilots going, you know, mainstream them, take them up across the country, and very soon the entire digital mass will change. As someone mentioned, Professor Manovani, that we are the most capable people in the world at one level. In the US, we are at one time used to be number two to Japanese Americans. At that time also, if you didn't count the income of the Nintendo owner, you were number one. Now, even when you count the Nintendo owner's income as Japanese American income, we are number one. So we are extremely capable and it's just, you know, some of these success stories to pan out and get mainstream for the time to turn, once you see the critical mass it is, it is easier, it is self-sustaining. If you look at some of the success stories, Singapore, you know, Taiwan, South Korea, and the more recent success stories, China, now Vietnam, that the tide turn and turn very quickly. You know, looking at China in the 1970s, the last thing you would imagine is a state of affairs that exists today. You know, huge success in the economy, success at cutting edge levels of technology, and prospects of huge success in the modern, you know, industrial age of industry of 4.0 and artificial intelligence and internet of things. So one could not have imagined looking at China in the 70s that such a turnaround was possible in such a short time. So India is even better place. It's a better place, you know, given our human resources, given our thriving, you know, entrepreneurship, so that that turnaround can come very quickly. And I think some of the answers were heard by us from the very, very distinguished panelists. So let me, after the time, 
to improve the section and thank my colleagues on the dais for their very, very invaluable and illuminating comments and let me thank the audience for the very, very yeah. patient hearing given to all of us and to the organizers once again for making this possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like, now like to call upon Mr. Anupam Gray, Foreign Secretary of History of Sexual Affairs, our co organizer of this conference, sir, to felicitate our guests. Can we have the claps going on, please? We have Dr. Sabit Chinoy. And last but not least, the session chair, Commerce Secretary, Sir Luke
ये कैप्चर कार्ड ना तो बिल्डिंग मध्य तरी लफड़ है नहीं तुला फोन कर नहीं नहीं आता कर मैं फोन करना 
किरण ने फोन कर चार्ज कर लेगा मोबाइल अपना
चेंज करा ना होता स्पेशल की नोट कुठे फोटो आहे ये पीजी बनवून आणले मेरी करता है फोटो तर मेरी करा मी बदलून आणते फोटो यांच्याकडे काय तुम्ही दाखवता है ना काहीतरी असेल ना तुमच्याकडे
लाइव को व्यू करते का नहीं व्यूवर्स दोन दाखो वन करंट वन करंट व्यूवर्स टू लाइक जीरो
तू कुछ लेकर
Thank you so much. Welcome you all here with the uh, loudest possible applause. Uh, may I welcome on stage? Thank you. May I welcome on stage Mr. Suresh Prabhu and Mr. Tali Bhargava. Mr. Suresh Prabhu, part of the Commerce and Industry Minister. And you, Mr. Suresh Prabhu, for many, many of his accolades. So, uh, Here is what I'm going to do. In the next 30 seconds, I'm going to be down there. All they're going to request Mr. Bhargava is to, uh, to give the opening remarks and then we will listen to Mr. Prabhu. And we will take the question if you like, sir. Prabhu mentioned that uh, he is very appreciative of the fact that Pune sirs like to all those in Pune like to write the questions and give in writing. So we'll continue that practice and we'll give the written questions. And after the QA, we will be heading for dinner that's being organized on the pool side. So with that, may I hand it over to Mr. Pradeep Bhagav, President of Maratha Chief of Commerce in the Civil Agriculture and Founder Member of Pune International Center. Mr. Bhagav. Uh, looking at our track records since yesterday, we have been on time and looking at the two main masters, Prashant and Nitendra, uh, I want to give a couple of disclosures. First of all, a lot of people thought it's a fireside chat in conversation with Sir, none of those. Uh, because for one, uh, Mr. Prabhu doesn't need any provocations. He is one who is warm and gives fire in the minds of everybody, so Mr. Prabhu will be on his own way. And sometimes these fireside checks is something like we had earlier in the day, uh, just a few minutes ago, with the way you ask questions, posers, so either you get a snatch from your questions or uh, you make it embarrassing. So we do none of that stuff, what we off in, what you want to do. Uh, I, my role is to introduce and I'll sit here and applaud all of you. To use the terminology of Asian in economic dialogue, there is no global or local value chain. There is only one value point, which is him, and his value will be directly transmitted to all of us with no tariff or non tariff values, with no GST. So this session is only for Mr. Babu to be talking to all of us, and this is going to be the same thing. 
However, I take the liberty of doing two things. One, of course, is to introduce Mr. Prabhu to the extent. A lot of you know a lot of things about him. So I wanted to bring out something aspect of his personality, which is incomplete. And secondly, since Mr. Prabhu has, uh, is going to be speaking here, I'm taking the liberty and I've talked to this, of giving very quick brief to you, sir, in the last 24 hours, what are the key points that have happened in the dialogue since yesterday evening. We'll give you this report and then Tori's on yours. A brief introduction is already available with all of you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Prabhu's role as not only as a minister and uh, in engaging as, as a special emissary of the Prime Minister, he has handled various portfolios. And if I could capture it for you, things that you don't know, in addition to doing having done a 360 degree with respect to various ministries, he's done in commerce, industry, environmental, forest, railways. Power, chemical and fertilizers, so we've done everything about Pakistan is all about. His personal life is also a 360. He is a banker, he a bank, he's an entrepreneur. None of you would know that he's engaged with 150 civil societies, you know, those are which are industries of social and environmental things. He's on international committees, including things like chairman of the Stark Farmers Forum, Asia and Asian Things. Mr. Prabhu was Rated as the best member of parliament in 13 Lok Sabha in 2001. Mr. Prabhu was the second best performing minister in India to be report in 2004. And what's, and what's interesting, it's, look at his energy tenacity. He's pursued PhD in climate change on energy and environment with, with, with Friday University in Berlin, and he's also pursued PhD in state public finances with Mumbai University. How much energy can a man have with all these wonderful things? So I'm honored to have you with us here. Very quickly, for the benefit, uh, we started this session yesterday. Dr. Kedkar and Ambassador Babali set the trend. Dr. Kedkar opined rightly that global trade and prosperity go together. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Babali talked about how powerful Asia is for it to have things. We did talk about history, but we solemnly resolved that Puna International Center is going to set up history, create history, because it's a first one, so that's our resolve. Then we had an outstanding inaugural where Dr. Neshankar, our external affairs minister, went to give to us to the video, very candid, very powerful. We had a very interesting panel of chief economic advisors, Mr. Baba Kanyani, you know, guest from Arkins and Sri Lanka. We talked about Asian prospects and why Asia is so important. A couple of things that came out, one was on ethical valuation. We need to pay value, be ethical about it. And secondly, about the trust and the trust deficit that exists for us to prosper, etc. Then Mr. Uday Kotak came very convincing and cohesive. He talked about moving from the, the traditional to Anglo Saxon <coughs> mode of financing, which requires deep bond market, which in turn requires risk taking and trust in the region. He left us with a proposal that India has to decide whether it's going to go for a Western model or a Chinese model, and our decision on 5G will establish where we are. Very convincing and very powerful. We had a very vibrant discussion on future of WD or something, sir, that you have invited in board, uh, chaired by Dr. Ruti Patel, our ex governor of the Bank of India. We had well, that was a very interesting session. We had our ambassador of China to WTO and ambassador of India to WTO there. They left us in no doubt who they thought was a major problem in WTO. The uh, name of the United States came out multiple times. And it was a very passionate conversation. I think Dr. Kodri Patel was able to control inflation in a more manner during his tenure as a reserve bank, but he was not able to contain the passion with which the discussion happened, an amazing, amazing conversation. Global value chain came up next set of today, the boy, under his chairmanship, there was a waste paper by Dr. Delta Rao, Delta Roy, and they talked about the need to go for uh, not only policy making, but the industry needs to be uh, excited about going in the global value change. The same thing got repeated uh, again at the end of this next session by Chair Mr. Lakshmi Puri, where it became clear that the power centers are still greater than the and it's not reaching to the country as 
when it happened with this. I'm coming to a very close thing. Today, they also had uh, amazing uh, articulation by Communist Kishore Mahbubani, who again justified and pushed for trade, international trade. And he says, the benefit is economics, poverty, uh, economic policies, and peace and cultural conflict. What he was saying that if you don't do it, anything's at stake. Finally, we had a session on open regionalization. Well, the world order cannot come in. The book is a question mark. Is it a bilateral, multilateral? Is that the answer? Take the bit of this. And it clearly was that export is not only essential for economic growth, but it also ultimately would lead to investment and would also lead to diverse, you know, more equitable distribution. So this was, in essence, the session that we have had in the last 24 hours around the theme that you know. Uh, we now look forward to hearing from you. And at the end of it all, as you said, we will take up your questions and go with yourself. Thank you. Good evening, friends. Let me thank. For all his kind remarks, and I thank Dr. Asheta for providing leadership to the Human Transit Center and organizing this very, very interesting program. Though the light is so strong that I can hardly see anybody, but whom I could see, I'm very sure. But the first person I can see when I sight is on is my dear friend, but not my minister. And also taking important responsibilities for me in different spheres. But Dr. Masekar and of course Nisha External Affairs and the Puna Interactive Center must be complimented and congratulated for organizing this very much. So now that the diplomacy had a different connotation. And diplomacy is as old as the living human beings. The older days, when we think the travel was, there should be a diplomat to go to the other side and try to resolve the issue. So diplomats have always been there. The diplomacy changed, but didn't change it as much as we are expecting to change now. In this world, whenever there is a high level visit, no head of state or head of government is going to come to your country and say that you are not doing well. And when we go to other countries, we say you are doing better than us. So these are all the common pleasantries which we can exchange. We we'll obviously make some statement which are necessary for the visiting dignitaries domestic audience. But largely, anybody now wants to develop a relationship with other country, we should say we'll be looking at how do I promote my economic interest with the other geography. And therefore now, the full part of diplomacy, we have to focus on economic diplomacy. And therefore the dialogue is extremely interesting. And that too, among the Asian countries. As you all know, Asia is not just the most populous continent of the world, which it is. We also home to the most important releases of the world of all here. If you look at it, it also at the same time the most volatile continent of the world. If you have to look at the hot spots, you can always identify that they are all here in some part of the Asian continent. Therefore, this is also 
another very interesting feature of Asia. But also, the future growth of the world will happen in Asia. As it is, the second largest economy of the world is Asia, third largest economy of the world is also Asia, the fifth largest economy of the world is also Asia, now India. And therefore, Asia means undoubtedly the future of the world. Demography, economy, possibility of conflicts, resources. If you take Africa, Latin America has more resources. Latin America, for example, has more than 24% of the water, almost 16% of, or 14% land, and only 6% of the population. So, resource-wise, this proportion is higher for the capital availability there. But even otherwise, resources, and now we need to define probably resources in a different context. But then, are resources. But the definition of materials is going to change very dramatically in a very foreseeable future. The future of materials is going to also depend, which also going to determine the future of economy. The kind of materials that we now will be able to produce, not necessarily from below the surface, but also probably derivatives of those surface materials is going to determine the future of the world. And there again, I can see a great amount of work that is being done in Asia. Whether it's Korea, whether it's Japan or China, it's being done in this part of the world. So, Asia is a future, and therefore, this kind of economic dialogue is still based. If you look at a world today, it is very challenging. And I am talking only about economic perspective. The largest economy, after we infused it more than 1.2 trillion dollars of tax debts, is still struggling to remain below 1 or 2 percent. The second largest block, second largest obviously, third largest is Japan, which is also facing this almost flat for a long time. China, for a variety of reasons, including now the hopefully temporary reasons with the virus, also struggling. We of the region has been also more or less stacked, even the largest economy of Europe. Germany, which also probably will get into recession in the next few quarters. And in that context, we really need to look at how do you position India with the rest of Asia, Asia with the rest of the world, and the only way we can do it is to look at how can we create more economic development. In fact, you mentioned the point that you discussed, and I see so many experts of WTO sitting in front of me. WTO, at a time when we need some sort of a steroid for economic growth, the threat is actually stunning. In fact, in 2008, the threat was growing at a rate faster than economic growth. Since then, we are seeing that economic growth and trade both have suffered, but trade has suffered more in the last few years' time. And if you don't have trade, how do you put economic growth? And you get trade, you need an organization. Can you have trade without nobody regulating it? Can you have trade of an international nature with such huge, huge volume? Can it happen unless there is somebody who will set the rules for that trade? And if the rules are set, obviously there is likelihood that somebody will not follow the rules. So there is a mechanism to ensure that the rules are enforced. Can it all happen without an organization like WTO? And at a time, when economic of the world are suffering, at a time when we need to put more weight behind the plate, the WTO is struggling. Not only struggling, probably facing existential crisis of a kind. And therefore, the one 
think that this dialogue is trying to focus on. It's so how to promote global tech, and if you want global tech for economic growth, that's what the purpose of the dialogue is. How can we get world trade organization facilitating promotion of global trade? As you are saying, WTO has a very interesting last two decades. When GIT was going to be converted to WTO, everybody opposed. If you recall, my friend was there from expert from the Dunkel draft was prepared, and the Dunkel draft was burnt in so many places. That people must be wondering, you know, Duncan must have been surprised, how do I am so famous, I don't know how they may find me. But Duncan himself didn't know that he could be known even outside of the city. But then Duncan Dark was burnt all over, including India. And India probably burnt him more and more number of times. But then we have seen that after some time, we are seeing now that Duncan was he promoted and a WTO was created. As an unimaginable success. In fact, I will tell you, I am making probably a statement which may be a little poor statement. But China's economic growth, and China now becoming the second largest economy, almost $50 billion, would not have been possible unless WTO joined WTO. And China joined WTO because they have to apply for members. China was not a founding member of GIT like India. Right? So they had to go and get a membership of the community. And when they wanted to be a member, they had to agree on so many conditions. While others followed. But China benefited from WTO events. The point is, WTO has made economic growth possible, exponential increase in global trade, but also at the same time, creating new economic entities. If China's economic growth is unprecedented, in world economic history. And that, in a way, is also facilitated by WTO. So just imagine at a time when we need WTO like this. Some countries are saying WTO should exist as probably one of our subsidiary organizations to my country. They should be not working in a way that WTO rules matter, but we decide the rules and we can keep changing the rules whenever we want to do. No organization can work in The great characteristic of WTO is that even a small country with population of maybe 50,000 has the same right as the largest economic power. Of course, that is the source of it. I understand. For those countries who have bigger economic power. But that is why WTO has succeeded. <coughs> and therefore, the first and foremost thing that our dialogue should focus on is how to make WTO a strong, vibrant organization. I am not saying that WTO should be strong and vibrant means we should not change at all. In fact, it can change more. It should become more dynamic. But that doesn't mean that we should give away. That, that we should give away WTO. Right? We in India, when, as a commerce and industry minister at that time, 2017 November, or December, when we are a US as minister, I realized that we are heading for a disaster. So I announced there itself that we will organize a mini ministerial of countries who are interested to make the beauty of work better. So we went around the country to the United States. 57 countries participated in the mini ministerial, and my friend is an expert on WTO, probably for the biggest ever mini ministerial. Because mini ministerial doesn't have good tax money members. We followed up. In 2019, April, just before the election, results are out, and we actually try to take that step forward. So we in India are very keen that we should make WTO a very vibrant organization. We should try to make it an organization which is forward-looking, but it has to be rule-based. No trade can happen without rules. And therefore, you cannot keep taking rules because if I play a football match and I realize that if, you know, I'm not able to score goal. So now I cannot suddenly in the middle of the game tell the referee, now why don't you put a goal post this side because I am not able to put my goal there. Don't ask too many people to cook. Defenders should be removed from here. So I can 
gold, make gold medals. Either you start again with, with a proper rules, or you cannot change a video like this. So therefore, you must ensure that the video remains rules, but becomes a viable dominant. It's the interest of Asia. Asian countries will benefit the most, but whole world will also benefit. And therefore, that is my first and foremost feel that we should try to do. Second issue, which you mentioned, about global marriage. You know, look at how the world has changed. There was a time that Mr. Pramod Chaudhary was a very successful company. Car industry. It's a great free company. But also very healthy company. Choice for Chaudhary would be or we want to do opposite the services. Typical choice, traditional choice for a company would be to make or buy. Whether I should buy something or I should make it on my shop floor. That was the choice. But we thought that was a limited choice. The choice for a business is make or buy. Over a period of time, we are seeing a complete change in that business model. Now it's no longer make or buy. It's a question of how do I join somebody else's business model? How do I join somebody else's supply chain? And this global value chain that you mentioned has become a new norm. Let's look at Nike. Nike is one of the top brands of the world. It has a tremendous brand we call value. Who wants to buy Nike? Very difficult to say. Nike is obviously an American brand. So you can say Nike is American. But probably it is a brand owned by America, but buying everything else happens outside of America. Except, uh, except the branding, probably nothing else is owned by America. Everything else happens outside. Take iPhone. iPhone, obviously, Apple, which owns iPhone, the brand, is American. Everything else happens outside of America. That to the Foxconn, which will make iPhones, which also will not make everything in China or Taiwan. They will not make everything there. They will buy something from different locations, put it together, and finally it will be sold under the brand name of Nike or iPhone in different parts of the world. Now, over a period of time, Nike will have this make or buy decision, or I don't have to make that decision. Then, Business plan is that I will have a far integrated ecosystem in which many people can join. So now, for you to have a more bigger economic footprint, you must have a possibility of integrating into global value chains or create your own value chain. You can create. Take like America as a you create one or you join one. Even if you create one, you are only creating one to be part of that. It's like material marketing. So material marketing means somebody else has started that, but he's also part of the chain anyway. <coughs> so the global value chain is no longer a theoretical possibility, but it's a practical reality. And therefore, how do you make sure that our economic growth model factors that into consideration? Now, every country, rightly so, you like to have the best policy for their trade. What would the policy? That I will export. And suppose if I say, I will export, but I will not import anything. Doesn't it sound fantastic? That I will export, but not import it. So I don't even have it. Let's just say I want to make you make products, I will go import, no competition, nothing. Only go import, so I export. But the idea is so good that all other countries are going to adopt this idea. So what is going to happen? All countries are going to say that we are deciding to adopt this model that we export, but not import it. All countries are going to decide only to export and not to import, then what happens? If 
If I say that buy shop, I only go to sell, but not go to buy it. All shop in India say that we only sell but not buy it. So what are you going to sell? What are you going to buy? So ultimately, it all comes the world decide that we are only going to export and not import this part. So therefore, to be part of a global value chain, we also have to realize that probably to get that global value chain in place properly to our own benefit, we must also have to have a proper flexibility and of import and export policy, which is trade policy, in place in a proper manner. Now, if you really look at it, alignment of your interest is very important. I'm not saying for import, we import everything. At the same time, you cannot necessarily export unless you have access to other market. If I am wanting an access to somebody else's market, that same country is going to say that provide access to my country's product. So it's a give and take. In fact, the trade-off is that, that I give something, in turn you also offer me something else. And therefore, to make this possibility of global value chain reality, our trade policy must be actually factoring this reality into the country. And to do that, we have to make sure that we import something which has a possibility of going into our product so that we can use that as component or raw material and we can go to export more. Incidentally, China is the largest exporter of the world. Largest. People always feel that China therefore must not be importing anything. They are the largest exporter. China is also incidentally one of the largest importers of the world. In fact, China runs trade deficit with some countries. China runs trade deficit, it may be fluctuating with ASEAN. China runs trade deficit even with Korea. China sometimes runs trade deficit even with Japan. So therefore it cannot happen that we have only one better. It is ideal. If all countries the world agree, that we'll be able to only export and not import, that's a best situation. But how to create that, I don't know. But so therefore probably the dialogue can do some ideas, we'll be able to work on it, we'll be a good idea. But as I said, the problem is that not only is the idea given confrontation, the Africans, the Latin Americans, the Europeans, the others will also like to say this is a brilliant idea. Let's not import anything from Asia, only export to Asia. Asia is going to say we not export anything, so it's not how it's going to work. So this another interesting facet of a dialogue should be how do you make sure that we benefit because I have some intrinsic strength in my economy. My products are very competitive. And to become competitive, also sometimes allowing foreign competition in the domestic market also helps. Not always, but it helps. So therefore, the international trade policy the global policy also must take into consideration that joining the global value chain, how do you make sure that our trade policy is also take acting into that? Other interesting and very emerging issues going to be in the Asian economic sense is the issue related to technology. I think more and more and more we will see that more and more technology oriented global trade will go to take place. It's not just technology per se, but even your traditional item that you're exporting, we have more and more technological input, technological facets of added to that. And therefore, technology is going to be key to this. In fact, China, despite the fact that it started as a low-end manufacturing, level intensive manufacturing, already graduated into a different level. It means now there will be more and more Knowledge based technology oriented, but not in fact finding more and more ideas. Intellectual popularity filing in China is increasing rapidly and dramatically. So, therefore, how do you actually make that happen is also going to be interesting. And that too, to make that, how do you bring the countries with similar aspirations together? And that brings us to the issue of foreign trade agreements. Those countries who are either complementarity or there's a possibility that by joining hands together, they can benefit from each other's combined strength to compete in other markets. That is what foreign trade agreements should be. And therefore, to make that experience work, first and foremost is you must do a baseline study very carefully. You must understand how do you benefit from the treated agreement, what is that I lack, and what is that I have a skill 
You can do that analysis is properly and then try to make agreements with those who have these possibilities. You can tremendously benefit from it. Incidentally, if you want any economy, and particularly India, we have an aspiration of $5 trillion economy. And I'm very sure it will become $5 trillion economy. I can tell you with confidence. The question of how many years? It might be sooner with a faster economic growth and a little, little later with slow economic growth. But India will be a $5 trillion economy. In that $5 trillion economy, the share of global trade, including imports and exports, put together, we have been actually $2.5 trillion. So just imagine, if you want $5 trillion economy, our share into that has to be $2.5 trillion, that's 50%. And to do that, we have to factor all the issues into consideration. The issue related to global valuations, issue related to FTS, issue related to our trade policy, all will have to be factored in, in a proper manner so that we can reach $5 trillion economy sooner. Incidentally, all FDI, which we need more. Because our domestic savings are fallen, we have to increase the domestic savings considerably. But even with increased domestic savings, we will still need investment from abroad. That is what will come in the form of FDI. Today we are getting portfolio investment, which is also good because that helps us to cash flow. But we need foreign direct investment. To get foreign direct investment, if our foreign trade policy, international trade policy, is not conditioned to that, it will also affect your foreign direct investment. FDI has a direct relationship with foreign trade. Technology. To great extent, we must develop our own technology, but technology infusion also happens through foreign trade in a considerable way. Employment generation. That will happen in a significant way. It will also happen through integrating into foreign trade. Because China will create so many jobs only because China has become a very dominant player into the global international trade. So therefore, any part of that, if you look at it, it will happen largely through this process. I think when we talk about economic dialogue, I don't know whether it was part of the session because I think Jerry is saying that. But we must also keep in account some of the issues which are considered non economic, but are very important for economic growth. One of them will be climate change. The effect of climate change on economic growth will be phenomenal. And in fact, the cost of adaptation, and particularly in Asia, cost of adaptation to climate change in some countries of Asia would be more than their economic growth. So, cost of adaptation to climate change is so high. Even if you have high economic growth and the adaptation rate is high, probably you will still have a net negative growth. So, climate change and economic growth and economic dialogue must also be taken into consideration very important. Energy which is going to be very important, but I consider energy as a part of the technology basket, which Dr. Masaryal is working on. Because today, we are almost on a threshold of getting into a different kind of energy basket for the world. We are already seeing huge growth into renewable energy, and I must compliment our Prime Minister that he thought about 170,000 megawatts of renewable energy. 100,000 of solar, 70,000 megawatts of wind, and we are almost on the path of doing that. And also he decided something very interesting. As a part of economic diplomacy, I would call it, or we can call it environmental diplomacy, is creating international solar alliance, which is again going to have a huge positive impact on both economic growth as well as reducing the carbon footprint. And therefore, that again will have a huge positive impact. So I think very clearly, Asia which is the future. But Asia is not just one single small little continent. There is the Far East Asia, there is the Middle East, there is the South Asia, there is the Central Asia, there is, we should call it Near East, because right now we call it Middle East. It was called Near East because it is near to the Europe. And they call it Far East because it was further from Europe. But now all these regions are Asia and all put together. Each one of them has some very interesting steps to offer the table. How do you make sure that we as a continent use this relative steps and make them work for a mutual benefit?
that could happen to the trade agreements, that could happen to technological trade agreements, this could happen to working on some exchange of parts, you could also have a big case, you could have different forms of engagement with each other regions and all that we should try to do so that we can harness the true potential of India's growth, Asia's growth together. And therefore, I think it's a very interesting dialogue with your age. I wish to be able to congratulate you and look forward to this dialogue resulting in something better. In fact, I must congratulate the external trade ministry because the future of diplomacy, and Mr. Puri started his career as the economic diplomacy of all because he played a very key role in economic diplomacy. Anyway. But now, economic diplomacy will be the future of diplomacy. And therefore, organizing this interesting program, I'm sure we'll be able to go to that high level of engagement in other countries to the means of economic instruments. Thank you very much. We should thank you. I think one point you mentioned, which I just very passing there I want to mention. You mentioned about financial instruments, I think that is another very interesting opportunity for trade. When you trade, talk about trade in either merchandise or services. In services, financial services are going to play a very key role. To develop new financial instruments, to help financing for various reasons, because you need infrastructure investment which will be long term, which has to be long decision period, something which will match only up to 20, 25, 30 years. So pension funds will be the right candidate for that. Especially in Asia, there are large pension deposit islands, including Japan, including Korea. And therefore, how to use those financing instruments within the continent itself for financing each other's requirement, that again is from a threat. And therefore, this again is a new dimension to possibilities of making it not possible. So once again, thank you very much. And I really wish you thank you for inviting me. And as I said, with the like being less, I can see many faces and now I realize that I am talking to those from whom I need to learn rather than tell them anything. So thank you for being so patient listening to me because I think it's also part of innovation. That many times teachers allow the students to speak and they try to listen. So I am really happy that I got the opportunity to talk to all of you. Thank you. Mr. Devan Bainkar, Dr. 
how should indian railway be diesel locomotive post to the way after electrification of railway stands indian railway stand b for 1000 locomotive see actually there are railway electrification but the plan was about 90% that some lines should be there i'm sure when now we are moving towards 100% electrification there will be some plan in place which i'm sure you sir you know that when we started working on it actually that a very interesting plan the savings from energy for railway which are now that time the complete gear that lay down plan was 45000 crores in about 6 7 years you can be a more or less track to do that and that was in many components it was not just one solarization using energy audits making sure that all there was possible energy in the the rooftops of railway stations we started the first ever solar day. actually the first in the world problem that time we started so i think all of this in place i think what they will do the design and sir at the right time the government will announce can cities be the major stakeholders in global value chain how mr samir in fact i will tell you what a great success story of china which we normally don't emphasize is the role of cities and the provincial governments china has a far more delegated economic powers to the local body in fact the mobile was a representative of china in tel the city mayors the provincial governors can take many economic decisions on their own and they are virtually the bosses of that country actually so i think the supply chain balance is also you are absolutely right we have to have the cities and they they big role in fact one great success story of india in global value chain which we not necessarily always remember is auto component industry in auto components india is now one of the top leaders i would say in the auto component industry and they are part of the global value chain so we what we make here can be used by any automobile company anywhere in the world so that means when it started there was a, if you remember there was some companies tamil nadu wanted to have as the best haryana obviously started that you will say here mars wanted to have pune ji to the people ji so incidentally was a close to here was a place where all these auto components were also being made so i think this is a great possibility of cities playing a very really big role actually i think it is and that what we should try to work on that mr sudhanwar kopadekar how could our manufacturing revival be accelerated for global market besides popping up domestic demand see actually one thing must try to understand what are we want to export because we are talking about for global markets what they want to sell we can only sell when there is a buyer for it the buyer has an option of buying the same product from different countries so our stand would be that we make a product which is of a great quality of a great price and therefore our industry has to be competitive if we are not competitive we are not going to export a good example of competition and how we have become globally competitive is pharmaceuticals i remember when dr masel was recently at equity with the chairman of the first public funded private arrangement the 50 crore that we set aside for the budget when i was the chairman of the industry in 1999 1999 i requested for the pharma companies that why don't you go and sell to the pharma products in latin america of course so puri would tell you that normally So they will say, how can we challenge the minister? Because you can say anything, but we have to see reason to challenge the minister. So they didn't say much, but industry wanted to say what is what is going on there. They went to Latin America, and today they export a lot of products of pharmaceutical to Latin America. But could they sell it just because we are a diplomatic relationship? Because we could play some uh, relationship? It did not happen. It will happen only because our pharma companies. Good police and journalists, particularly journalists. They produce journalists of a very high quality. That's why they sell. So the only way we 
You can capture the international market is by selling prepared or manufacturing goods of good quality or good price in India. Again, I come to the second point. The first that we started in a very gradually keeping as a part of the discussion. It's value chain. It is no longer that you have to manufacture the end product from end to end in India. You can make a product in different levels. You decide which level you have to join. You have to join in the lower end of the value chain or the higher end of the value chain. You can join in that. So we must find out that specialization. And to do that and to be part of a value chain, you must have a proper international trade policy which will facilitate that plan. So I think this is something which will definitely be helpful. What do you think Indian industry should do in the global market rather than depending on government incentive for export? I think that is true that Indian industry unless they are intrinsically on their own very competitive, main incentives will not help. But I must tell you something. Why do you need to provide incentives for exports in India? You must understand. Because there are certain disadvantages that Indian industry suffers from. It is called externalities. On certain externalities, you have no control. And therefore, on those externalities, you must compensate them. Otherwise, you are putting them at a completely odd even field. So they cannot compete at all. For example, power cost. Power cost in India is so high that it cannot be logistic cost. Is so high. The time of turnaround in logistics is so high. So, therefore, unless you can actually make sure that all those issues are handled, you must compensate them in some form or other. Otherwise, how do you expect them to compete with the other country where all these costs are half of what we are paying to the industry? It's not very low. So, subsidies have a different purpose. You can call them subsidies or you can really call it as a part of compensation for some of the informatics that is occurring. So, I think. Over a period of time, you are absolutely right. Industry must be able to face competition on their own. But till such time that it happens, you must be able to do it. And I think the former chairman of the Indian Army agreed with me that this is how it should be done. So I think we should work towards making industry completely self like competent, strong enough. But till such time it happens, we must have a handholding to the industry. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, while you put the uh, loudest round of applause, I'll request my colleagues to please come over. And I'll request uh, Pramod Sohli to please come to the Supreme Court and we will pray for you, sir.
ये जा तू नहीं कर तू पहले सर ने नंतर कहाँ कर रखते इतने मोड़ बंद कर भाई कहाँ है ना सर पर आज टूल किट ही है उसे टूल किट देना लाऊं करे बंद करूं लगी चिकाई काम नहीं था ते बाजी है मुझे जॉब से मिला उन्हें था अरे नहीं ना अब पर एक काम करती थे पहले गेट पर शेक दम पहले एक्सेलर होती वर होती बॉक्स पायलट चाहिए था ये बंदरों का बोर्ड चालू है ये जाएगा क्या? नहीं शायद हो गया है। आपके पास तीन कार्ड दिए थे ना ना क्यों कार्ड? अभी चेक कर लीजिए। हो गया शायद। 